Session of the Portland City Council. Keelan, please call the roll. Good morning. Rubio. Here. Ryan. Here. Gonzalez. Maps. 
Here. Taylor. Here. Uh, before we hear from legal counsel on the rules of order and decorum, there's two items of business I want to cover quickly here up front. First of all, uh, Happy New Year, everyone. This is our first meeting of 2024. And of course, that means that we're going to be electing a new city council president. I want to thank Commissioner Rubio for her service over the last six months in this role. And Commissioner, I particularly want to appreciate the fact that you had to step in a couple of times when I was not able to be here in person. Uh, in the order of rotation, it is now, <clears throat> excuse me, it is now Commissioner Mapp's turn to be elected president of the city council. I move the election of Commissioner Mapps to be president of the Portland City Council. Can I please get a second? Second. I got a second from Commissioner Rubio, who could not move faster to pass the gavel to Commissioner Mapps. Uh, Keelan, please call the roll. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Gonzalez. Hi. Apps. I just want to say it's an honor to serve in this capacity. I vote aye. Miller. I want to thank you, Commissioner Maps, for stepping into this role. I vote aye, and the appointment is approved. Next up, I'd like to also share some timely news as we continue to move forward in our charter transition work. Starting next week, city council meetings will resume in person at the Development Services Building while Council Chambers and City Hall are being renovated. Both in-person and virtual options for participating in our sessions will be available. We have been notified by legal counsel that because there may be some code that specifically refers to the location of City Council, we would like to formally vote to move the Council sessions to the 1900 building. So with that, I move that we hold council meetings at the 1900 building, 1900 Southwest 4th Avenue, beginning the week of January 16th, 2024, until the council chamber renovations are complete at Portland City Hall. Can I please get a second? Second. Second from Commissioner Maps. Thank you. Keelan, please call the roll. Rubio. Aye. Brian. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Wheeler. Hi, the motion carries. Please note council will meet in room 2500 on the second floor of the 1900 building. Our first council session at that new location will be on January 17th next week at 9.30 a.m. I'll now pass it to the city attorney to go through the rules of order and decorum. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Portland City Council. To testify before council in person or virtually, you must sign up in advance on the council agenda at www.portland.gov slash council slash agenda. Information on engaging with city council can be found on the council clerk's webpage. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. A timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If you cause a disruption, a warning will be given. Further disruption will, will result in ejection from the meeting. Anyone who fails to leave once ejected is subject to arrest for trespass. Addis additionally, council may take a short recess. Your testimony today should address the matter being considered. When testifying, state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Disclose if you are a lobbyist, and if you are representing an organization, please identify it. For testifiers who are joining virtually, please unmute yourself once the council clerk calls your name. Thank you. All right. Uh, being that this is our first meeting of the year, we roll the agenda all the way back to the beginning. First up is communications. Item zero, 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 one. Request of Joanne Reese to address council regarding Reedway Safe Rest Village. Good morning, Joanne. Joanne, you're muted. Is this better? Yeah. There we go. Okay, you. thank you. Joanne, volunteer with Lens Strong Housing Team, making Lens a home for all our neighbors. Safe Rest Village Reedway, stakeholder. Like stakeholders from other SRVs, I am resorting to public communications. 
Given only three minutes, I will forward background as written testimony. Community engagement around SRV Readway has been unacceptably tokenized. We can have no opinion about Urban Alchemy's SRV Readway operations because despite its being in operation since July 2023, the SRV team has yet to arrange an introduction. Lens Strong Housing Team supports prison re-entry second chance programs as reducing recidivism and removing a major impediment to securing housing. As author Matthew Desmond reminded, without stable housing, everything falls apart. However, the city's gatekeeping for urban alchemy is eroding community trust. We are currently relying on hearsay and a multi-part street route series by Jeremiah Hayden. SRV team discontinued stakeholder meetings in October 2022. Stakeholders were never invited to the tour of SRV Readway in July 2023. SRV team refused to allow us a meet and greet, similar to those organized by Cultivate Initiatives at Menlo Park. We've been trying since October 2023 to get a meeting with someone from the mayor's office without any acknowledgement. On January 5th, 2024, in a response to an inquiry about a good neighbor agreement, we were referred to a meeting being hosted by LNLA this Thursday with the emergency humanitarian director and an SRV team member. The following day, our family received a postcard about a January 22nd listening session from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. with Urban Alchemy and the city shelter team to discuss the expansion of the SRV. Is SRV Ridway being transformed into a mass encampment? There is trauma associated with mass internment camps and with sweeps, both to unhoused and housed neighbors, many of whom in Lentz are immigrant refugee with histories of generational trauma. As a diverse community of poor, working poor and working class neighbors, housed and unhoused, we have always looked out for each other. We don't need to be preached at about humanitarian crises. We are demanding equity, transparency and accountability, and that all neighborhoods particularly those privileged with more resources and that haven't been victimized by city-sanctioned blight and historic disinvestment, be required to support humane solutions to houselessness, not just those neighborhoods with little to no voice. We seriously question the value of, last, of large mass encampments and camping bans as a humane solution to the housing crisis. Thank you. I'm done. Don't go away. Uh, I think a couple of us have comments. First, Commissioner Ryan. Yes, thank you, Mayor, and thank you for your showing up this morning, Joanne. As you mentioned, I appreciate that you mentioned it. We have a listening uh, session, which is scheduled on uh, January 22nd in Lentz, and the meeting has been called specifically to hear from community on how to be successful in increasing the capacity that you mentioned. I really do encourage you to attend and participate in the session. Staff from Urban Alchemy will be included in that session. And it's a great opportunity for the community to express their concerns. So I appreciate your um, showing up this morning. Wanted to make sure we I clarified that the engagement continues. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank Thank you, Commissioner Ryan. Uh, new year, new approach. Um, I'm going to have a shorter leash on commentary and counsel that's not accurate. So uh, first of all, Joanne, uh, why aren't you meeting with the Lens Livability Association when they meet? with Urban Alchemy and the uh, folks at the Safe Rest Village. We, we have met with them many, many times. They are representatives of the community. Those meetings are open to anyone. Why have you chosen not to participate? Uh, as far as I know, I have been in constant communication with LNLA. I have not been attending their meetings, but the um, executive directors of LNLA, Char Penny is a member, a stakeholding member, and Lundstrong Housing Team and LNLA have been um, working very closely along with PDX Saints and with Sisters of the Road um, in order to do this. So, um, I don't see why you're accusing, it seems indirectly accusing me of not doing my share I, about attending you, meetings. You said that there was not an opportunity for people in the neighborhood to interact directly with either the Safe Rest Village team or Urban Alchemy. And what I'm you telling mean? you that those opportunities do exist. I suspect you know they exist. And you're coming here and you're telling the public something else. 
Now, I have a second question for you. You said my staff has been unresponsive and unwilling to meet with you. Did you not meet with Hank Smith from my office? Uh, no, sir. We did not. You we did got not. a we had he an just, email. He, uh, uh, Key, uh, Skylar, go ahead. Sorry, he just emailed her this week, Joanna. Okay. Very good. So we are in communication with Joanna. Is that correct, Skylar? Yes. Okay, good. D does that solve your problem? And it sounds like you have inroads to my team and you now know how you can also meet with Urban Alchemy and Safe Rest Village. Are, are you satisfied with that? Uh, I just wanted to say something as a no. taxpaying uh, activist who um, basically are the stakeholders on the SRV Readway team probably did as much work on our own nickel and our own clock as one and a half to two city staffers. And I'm feeling, I'm, I'm using I statements here. I'm feeling that you're disrespecting me. Uh, we met with SRV team, as I said, uh, we were meeting between January, 2022 and October, 2022. We were meeting regularly for one hour meetings. That was discontinued in October, 2022. And I have been in constant communications with LNLA. Char will go in and admit that, I know, um, and with PDX Saints and with the other stakeholders. So I don't, I didn't appreciate this um, attitude that I was not, or Len Strong Housing Team was not doing its share about cooperating with other people. That's all I'm saying right now. Right, fair, um, fair, wait, fair, let me fair, finish, fair, please, because sure. it's, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. The other thing, too, is, again, you falsely accused me of having met with Hank um, Smith. Uh, we're having confusions, and I mentioned that to Mr. Smith as well, too, that um, because there's so much changing of where who's in charge of what we have commissioner rubio in charge of housing we have commissioner ryan in charge of the safe rest village team we have the mayor in charge of urban alchemy people are getting very confused recently what happened is we were getting emails from the city shelter team and none of us on the stakeholding group had any idea who the city shelter team was because we had been communicating with the safe rest village team and we found out just this last week that I guess the there's been a rebranding and uh, Safe Rest Village team is now city shelter um, team. So I would appreciate and I'm speaking for Lundstrung housing team, but probably other stakeholders may feel as well, too, that we don't get publicly humiliated in a public forum either and being accused of stuff that we haven't um, done or. OK, uh, well, I, 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 just, I heard your testimony and I heard you say that there has not been communication or opportunities for the community to meet with the Safe Rest Village team. I heard you say there's not been an opportunity for you to meet with my team. And I, I correct the record that you, you did not meet with Hank. You're in email communication with Hank. But I guess <clears throat> my plea to you is this is complicated. This is really difficult work and it does impact the community and it does impact neighborhoods. Uh, I think we can all figure out as adults how to work together on this. So that's all I'm saying is let's let's yeah, let's just communicate. Let's get our interests out on the table. We're going to do everything we can to engage with the community. We understand that nobody likes to have homeless encampments in their neighborhoods. We all get that, but we're also all trying to figure out how do we solve the problem. And this is a strategy that is working and we need you to hang with us, Joanne. So that's, that's all I'm asking. Skylar, you get the final word. No, I, I just also wanna, um, it might be helpful, uh, Brandy Westerman, who's the new director of that city shelter, uh, process all of our city shelters under one um, umbrella. She is actually meeting with the West Livability Association this week, and so I'd encourage you to attend that. It'd be great for you to meet her in person, um, ask her different questions. She's leading on all the Safe Rest Villages and the temporary alternative shelter site work. Yeah, yeah and, and we do have Joanne, that scheduled. So, yeah. Joanne, to that, to that end, uh, that's actually a great suggestion, Skylar. Joanne, I have actually moved Brandy into my office so that I can get regular updates, regular communication and stay on top of it. So I, I would appreciate your feedback after that and hear whether you were satisfied with that interaction or not. And I did say in the in my um, three minute communications that, yes, we were we were going to attend the LNLA 
this meeting uh, right. this Thursday. LNLA did invite us specifically even before, and we were going to attend that. I also wanted to say, though, that um, a big impediment to um, the, the public being able to communicate with city council, and the reason why we're feeling done too, as opposed to being collaborated with, is the fact that th since COVID lockdown, it's been very difficult to get any responsive to anything, email replies or um, returns to voicemail. So that's becoming extremely frustrating. And a lot of community members are feeling done too, as opposed to being collaborated with. And I'm, I'm I don't want to bicker back and forth about this, but people did look at the fact that when Laurelhurst was having its problems with the houses, you gave, you're giving them a pickleball court. Uh, yeah. Laurelhurst has far more resources than Lentz does. And again, we're tired of being preached at about humanitarian crises. We have people living the humanitarian crisis in Lentz. We also have people who every time we walk out our door are exposed to the humanitarian crisis in Lentz. And we are well trained in mutual aid and compassion and love. And we've been doing it for a long time. But here, I feel very here, disrespected here, here. right now. So thank you. Here. Okay, well, here, here, here. So I, I don't I don't want you to leave feeling disrespected, Joanne. So let, here, let, let's let's do this. Um, I, I think we both got our views out on the table. Uh, I've heard you, and I heard you say that, that you would like better communication, faster and more responsive communication. You now have Hank's direct email address. Uh, you should assume that connection with him is the same as connection with me. Brandy, as I say, works a couple of doors down the hallway from where I'm sitting here, and she'll be meeting with you, it sounds like, next week. Uh, we need to work together on this. We we all agree this this is not an ideal scenario. I want to work with you. I want to work with everybody in Lentz. I'm not trying to favor one neighborhood over a different neighborhood, but I, I hear what you are saying, and I see why you are saying what you're saying. Uh, let's see if we can put the pieces together and have everybody come out of this feeling respected and that we're moving the community forward. Can, can we agree on that? Yeah, I would say so. Awesome. I really appreciate it. Uh, Commissioner Gonzalez had a comment to Joanne. I just wanted to observe. I, I got a visit with Commissioner Ryan, this uh, SRV uh, in uh, late fall, early winter, and was blown away by the folks turning their lives around there. They were deep, really appreciative of the shelter they're being provided, the services they're connected with, the safety and the community there. Um, so I, I just want to add the two cents to that, to this discussion. These are changing people's lives. This is the best solution, along with our task sites that we found to connect in, in that space between the streets to longer term housing. Uh, I fully support the team that is doing this hard work. So, um, again, I, I was positively blown away by my experience out there and, uh, we still have a lot of work to do, but I appreciate the work the team's doing. Thanks. All right, thank can just, you. Can I just add a real quick thing? Yeah, go ahead, Commissioner Gonzalez, that there is a phone number posted on the web of each site. So there is access. Thank you. Thanks. All right, oh, good I, discussion. Can I just say one thing, though? All right, you about get the, the last word, Joe. Yeah, yeah. The, um, the phone number from Urban Alchemy just directs to voicemail that doesn't get uh, forwarded to anybody. And then when we were told, we, we asked how we could email them, and we were told to direct emails to the San Francisco office, which also does not reply. So you need, uh, you all need to know that. So okay, that's that's good feedback. Uh, Skylar, can you look into that and see if if maybe there's some misdirect there? Thanks, Joanne, for yeah. for raising that, and and thank you for being here. We do appreciate it. I hope you know that. Thank you. Uh, that's item number one, folks. <laughs> now, now. <laughs> We'll move Long on to item, <laughs> item number two. <laughs> Request of Kathleen Sharp to address council regarding parks in Northwest Portland. They canceled their request. All right. Thank you. Uh, uh, next individual, please. Item number three. Request of Micah Palmer to address council regarding homelessness and property theft. They haven't joined okay. us yet. Uh, she, oh. uh, has not joined us yet. Okay, very good. Uh, item number four, next individual. 
Request of Gregory Fisher to address council regarding light rail lawsuit. They also haven't joined us. Well, we, we could have kept Joanne around for a while longer. That's we, we, we cut her short. Uh, number five. Request of Jan Verinder to address council regarding safe biking and pedestrian infrastructure. Jan, are you here today? Yes, hi, I'm Jan hi. Verinder. Uh, thanks for having me. Although I don't know you, I'm certain you know transportation and how it affects climate, commerce, housing, everything. You deal with it every day. What I'm curious about though, is what you've lived that shaped your ideas about transportation. Have you walked a busy street on a rainy night and hesitated to step off the curb because you knew drivers wouldn't see you? Did you wait for a break in traffic and then hurry to the other side wondering if you'd make it to your bus stop or die in crossing the next street? Have you been hit by a car while riding your bike or walking or perhaps have you seen someone else get hit? Have you answered the phone and heard the caller from the hospital say the person you love is in their emergency department, hit by a car while riding his bike? Did you run to your car and try not to panic when it wouldn't start because you were crying so hard you couldn't get the key in the ignition? Have you been to a memorial for a rider or walker killed by a driver? I want to say I hope you haven't had my experiences, but honestly, I do hope you know some of this pain on a personal level. Why? Because this pain makes us passionate advocates for building truly protected bike lanes and sidewalks instead of removing them. Who rides in your bike lanes? Well, lots of us. I lead riders to Portland to visit your shops, show off your bike lanes, paths, your bridges, and teach people bicycle connections. They're amazed it's easy to get from Vancouver to downtown Portland on a bike. Some of my riders can't drive. They can't afford it, health conditions prevent it, they lost their license or they're too young. I ride for my health, especially since it declined after turning 70. I ride for errands to save the planet. I teach adults and kids to do the same. I once heard we need to consider not just our kids and grandkids when we work to improve the world, but also seven generations into the future because what we know what we do today will affect how they live tomorrow. I'm sure you've heard that thought, but back then I hadn't, and I was impressed by the idea that we should care about people we can never know. I realize that's essentially what you do every day. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Appreciate it very much. And and unfortunately, uh, yes, I, I can tell you that uh, my views are definitely shaped by personal experiences as well as things that have happened uh, to others that I love and care about. And I suspect that's true of every member of the city council. And I appreciate your being here today and sharing your experiences and reminding us of the importance of the work that we do around transportation. Uh, so thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, that completes communications. Have any items been pulled off the consent agenda, Keelan? No items have been pulled. Please call the roll on the consent agenda. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Epps. Aye. Miller. Aye. The consent agenda is adopted. The first time certain item, please. Item number six, a proclamation. Proclaim the second week of January 2024 to be Slavic and Eastern European Heritage Week. Colleagues, our next item is the proclamation honoring Slavic and Eastern European Heritage Week, as Keelan just said. That is from January 8th to 15th, 2024. I will pass this over to Commissioner Maps to open and introduce our presenters. Commissioner Maps. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, colleagues, here's the run of show for this morning. Uh, today, we have three invited guests who will share their thoughts on Slavic and Eastern European Heritage Week. The members of council will have an opportunity to offer their comments. The mayor will read the proclamation in English. And finally, the <clears throat> proclamation will be read in Russian. 
Um, here today to kick off that presentation and to introduce today's panel, we have uh, Svetlana Heaton uh, with Environmental Services. Welcome, Svetlana. Good morning. Thank you for having us. Of course. Uh, my name is Svetlana Hedin. Uh, Slavic Empowerment Team is here at the um, Irko Slavic and Eastern European Center. There is quite a few of us in here. Um, in addition, uh, we also have Alan Ellis here from the Khabarovsk Sister City Association. So um, we have a quiet, quite good group um, gathered together to celebrate with us. Uh, so I'm here as a founding member of the Slavic Empowerment Team and former co-chair of the Slavic Advisory Council and also employee of Bureau of Environmental Services uh, Community Partnership Group. Uh, I know that they're here supporting me as well online. So thanks, guys. Um, this is our seventh annual proclamation. Uh, we are proud to, to take a moment to honor and uplift members of Slavic and Eastern European community living in the greater Portland area. We are here, here to give a voice and recognition to this unique and beautiful culture that makes our city more diverse and <clears throat> empowered. I would like to recognize and thank Tamara Burkovska for translating the proclamation into Russian for us. In addition, I would like to invite all of you to the Slavic and Eastern European uh, celebration hosted by Immigrant and Refugee Community Organization or IRCO on January 31st. And today we have three speakers that are going to share their stories. Uh, first is Irina Chiradeiko, and she is a program supervisor at the Irko Slavic and Eastern European Center. Then we'll have Zoya Suritz. She is a, a former member of the board of the directors for the Khabarovsk Sister City Association. And she's currently a Russian language teacher at the Franklin High School. And then I will conclude the um, testimony. So I will be the third speaker for today. Um, so with that, I will invite Irina to share her story. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Irina Cherdeko. I was born in Ukraine and immigrated to United States, to Portland, Oregon, with my parents at age of 15. And I experienced all the challenges of adapting to a new culture and educational system. This early experience sparked my passion for helping others to navigate uh, similar transitions and overcome obstacles. As soon as I immigrated, I attended high school, and that provides stark contrast to educational system I was accustomed to. Despite initial difficulties, I embraced the opportunity to learn and adapt to new teaching methods and cultural norms. This experience taught me resilience, flexibility, and the importance of embracing diversity. Through my journey, I have actively pursued a career in social work. For the past 19 years, I have been working as a full-time social worker dedicated to making positive impact on the lives of individuals and families in need. <clears throat> as a social worker, I developed expertise in various areas. I have focused on providing assistance and support to individuals facing difficult life circumstances, including refugees and immigrants. I'm passionate about helping them integrate into new communities, access essential services, and regain their independence. Our organization, IRCO and SEEK, is a great organization that is known for a place that is the first or one of the first stops for refugees when they immigrated to United States. Our organization is dedicated to provide vital support and assistance to refugees fleeing from difficult conflict, persecution, or other challenging circumstances. We firmly believe that every individual deserves safety, dignity, and the opportunity to build their lives. Our mission is to offer comprehensive aid and sustainable solutions to refugees, ensuring their protection, empowerment, 
and successful integration into a new community. We work tirelessly to address their immediate needs and provide them with the tools and resources necessary to thrive in new environment. Uh, we're providing many different services. I wish I could tell you about each of them, but because we have very limited time, I will use only one example of uh, work with our seed community. Last year, in 2023 and summer and the fall we had two amazing teens retreat we're gonna show pictures now so that's the pictures from the teens mm -hmm. retreat oh not yet not yet sorry we're gonna share pictures okay. now oh it's there oh wow so in the world grappling with challenges and displacement, a beacon of hope emerged in SEEK, where a group of resilient young souls found solace and support in a teens refuge retreat organized by SEEK. Oh. This retreat aimed to provide a heaven for children facing the hardship of forced migration. The retreat offered a diverse range of activities designed to foster a sense of community, healing, and skilled development. From art therapy sessions to fun time, the children immersed themselves in supportive environment that encouraged self-expression and personal growth. Our focus was not just on meeting their immediate needs, but creating an environment where they can dream again. The activities were curated to help them build resilience and form of connection. Navigating the complex of trauma, language barriers, and cultural adjustment presented unique challenges for both the children and organizers. However, these challenges became stepping stone to resilience as the retreat uh, became a safe space for open dialogue and understanding. Organizing this retreat was not just about charity, it was in investment in the future of these children and our community. The retreat has had profound positive impact on participating children. Friendship was formed and skills were acquired that extend beyond the boundaries of the retreat. The atmosphere of love, acceptance, instilled in newfound sense of hope for a brighter future. I will share you a few testimonies that uh, those kids from retreat was sharing with us. I never thought I could feel at home again, but this retreat showed me that home, it's not just a place, it's the people around you. I feel that I belong here. They accept us for who we are. This is the best days of my life. So the teens, Refugee retreats stand as a statement of resilience of young spirits in the face of adversity. We're providing nurturing environment. It's not offered temporary relief, but plant seed of hope that we will continue to grow in the hearts of these children, reminding us all of power of compassion and community. Looking ahead, the Sikh have ambitious plans to expand the impact of the retreat. SIG is actively seeking support and partnership to ensure that the more children can benefit from this transformative experience. We want to be seen, heard, and acknowledged, and we hope that the city of Portland will support us. We, Slavic and Eastern European Center, are passionate about supporting refugees and immigrants as they navigate new environment and work toward rebuilding their lives. I believe by that by uh, fostering compassion, understanding and empowerment, we can create more inclusive and welcoming society for all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Irina. <clears throat> so our second speaker is um, Zoya Suritz. Zoya, are you with us? Yes, I am with you. Hi, good Hello. morning. You can go ahead and start your presentation. 
Um, I was asked to um, tell about how the things are right now in Russia, because I have uh, a lot of relatives and friends, and uh, I am. Um, uh, I was asked to um, testify from what I'm seeing and hearing, because actually I haven't been to Russia um, uh, since 2021, and uh, the reason is obvious. Um, you know, I have uh, people living all across Russia, from the Far East, where my family resides, and my mom, and my sister, and uh, I have friends in uh, St. Petersburg and Moscow, pretty much everywhere. And um, uh, the feelings about uh, the current situations are um, situation or situations because we have uh, several conflicts go going on right now. Um, they differ. And, uh, for example, uh, older generation tends to take one side. Uh, the younger generation is uh, on the other side. And uh, um, I am hearing that um, there is a lot of tension um, going on right now um, in the society. And um, a lot of uh, things that are up in the air and people are not um, so free to, today to express their opinions about the current situation, um, especially now before the, before the uh, elections. And uh, especially when we hear that a lot of people are being sent to um, prison for their um, uh, for ha for having another opinion about their um, war actions. So um, that makes me um, very um, um, indecisive to go back to Russia. Uh, first of all, uh, it's um, so it's, it's of course financially and uh, uh, logistically, it's not it's not an easy fit right now um, because uh, Russia is closing up and a lot of uh, um, routes that I used before are not open. Uh, so this is my personal situation, and that's what I hear. And uh, um, I'm compassionate. Luckily, most of my uh, friends in Russia and are here. We share the same opinion. We are against war. We are not supporting the politics, the policy of uh, President Putin. But um, in the families, I hear a lot of uh, conflicts because of the different opinions. And uh, in my family, we try not to touch this subject because uh, uh, um, their line of communication is so thin right now that I don't want to... Um, um, I don't want to any uh, separation at this point, um, or or at all. Uh, what I what I hear and see from here um, from the point of view of a teacher, because I'm a, a teacher of Russian language here at Franklin High School, we have a, a, a unique program for. Um, it's basically a Russian immersion program when the kids come to uh, Kelly Elementary School to begin their journey with studying Russian for uh, 13 years at school and possibly continuing uh, later on in life, which um, uh, this path um, some of my students take, take on and go to uh, higher education uh, establishments and continue studying Russian or even go go overseas to um, in, implement the um, uh, Russian language skills. Um, but right now, of course, it's possible to do only in uh, Estonia, Kazakhstan, former Soviet um, republics, but now independent um, countries. Um, I am glad that there is still a great interest uh, among um, heritage speakers and non-heritage speaker, speakers uh, to study um, the language that I teach, my mother tongue. Uh, and um, right now, what um, we experience is that to my class, the, the class of Russian language, um, come the students uh, who escaped from the war actions in Ukraine.
So uh, they speak perfect Russian. They are from the eastern part of uh, uh, Ukraine, which is mostly Russian speaking. Um, and the reason they come to my class um, is for them for easier and better integration into the new society, new life. Um, and they really um, uh, bring a lot of um, good vibe to the class. And of course, a, the expertise of Russian language, um, they share it and um, um, I like it. So that's the situation um, in my life and the life of my um, compatriots and um, my students. If you have any questions, I'm glad to answer. Thank you, Zoya. Thank you. <clears throat> and now um, I will speak a little bit about myself and, and my story is a little different than what you heard previously uh, during our proclamations before. Um, I'm going to share my screen so you know where I, where I came from so you can see the map of um, place where I was born and raised. Um, so I was born and raised in a um, Russian family in Riga, which is the capital of Latvia. Uh, Latvia is one of the countries located on the shore of the Baltic Sea between Lithuania and Estonia. And before 1991, it was one of the 15 countries of the Soviet Union before it broke up. At that time, the population of Latvia was a little over two and a half million people and majority were Latvian, uh, but almost half of the population were Russian, Ukrainian, Poles, Jews and others. People could easily travel across 15 countries of the former Soviet Union. It was kind of like for you to travel across United States. <clears throat> After Latvia became independent, I'm gonna stop sharing so you can see me again. <clears throat> After Latvia became independent in 1991 uh, with the collapse of Soviet Union, lives of many people in Latvia who were not ethnic Latvians changed drastically. Latvian nationalists started discrimination against non-Latvian residents, people like me and my family. People were discriminated by language. Latvian language became mandatory everywhere, even though the adic no adequate or affor affordable language classes were available prior to this change. Public offices started providing resources in Latvian only. No language support was provided to people visiting public offices or hospitals. It was nothing like here in United States. If a low English proficiency person goes to the doctor office, they request, they can request and will be provided a free translator services. Teaching in schools and textbooks were changed to Latvian only. Teachers had to pass Latvian language test to confirm their certification or plain, plainly quit. Many people lost their jobs or could not pursue a career of their choice due to the language barrier. For example, my brother wanted to become a construction worker and went to the community college, but could not finish it because all classes were offered in Latvians. And since no affordable Latvian language classes were available, he had to drop from college. Many of ethnic ethnicities other than Latvian had no choice but to leave the country. Many of them were senior people who lived and worked in Latvia for decades and a lot of young people. As of today, population of Latvia has reduced by almost half, primarily because people who were not Latvians were departed. Um, so what is what my reasoning for leaving Latvia? When I turned 16, this is the age when young people get their first passport. I applied for my passport. It was a big deal for any young person. And I was excited to get the document showing that I'm a grown up. I remember taking an official picture, submitting the documents and finally receiving my passport. When I opened it, <clears throat> The front page said, the passport of an alien. 
I was confused and shocked at the same time. I was born and raised in this country. My parents lived here almost all their lives. I could read, speak, write in Latvian. There must be a mistake. <clears throat> I asked the official the answer and the answer was because my parents were not Latvian citizens and because I was born before Latvia became independent, I became an alien. <laughs> Practically nobody in my own country. At about the same time, I was going through an on the job training as part of my college education. My supervisor put me aside <clears throat> one day and said, you're a hard working girl and I will be happy to provide you with a strong reference, but because you're Russian, you will not be able to build your career in this country. <sighs> I'm sorry. This, this brings a lot of memories. <sighs> So these events got me thinking and I start looking for opportunities outside of Latvia. Outside of leaving my family and looking somewhere else. I decided to explore a student working visa options that allowed students to become, <clears throat> to come to United States for six months and work. I came to United States and start working as a cashier. It was not easy, especially with limited English that I had at that time. But soon I learned that I could attend free classes to improve my English, which was amazing to me. I start feeling that I am I'm not an alien here in United States, <laughs> but I'm one of many as part of my melting pot. <laughs> Oh my goodness, I didn't know we were going to go this emotional. Fast forward, <clears throat> I found a better job, I made friends, met my future husband, got the college degree, I became a United States citizen, and never in, in my 22 years <clears throat> in United States, I felt being an alien, or was made feel like one. I had a cultural shock when I first moved to United States, but it is different than feeling rejected, being a nobody in the country you were born in and raised. I'm blessed with a loving family, an adorable toddler, and one more baby co coming to this world in April. I have a satisfying job and supportive friends. And I hope that other countries and their governments will learn from the United States about how to make their people feel valued and respected members of the community. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Commissioner, Ma <laughs> Commissioner Maps. Well, um, I just want to take a moment to thank our guest um, for today's presentation. Um, it was powerful. It was educational. I'll tell you, um, it's probably comes to no surprise to anyone on this council that uh, this proclamation, which I think we've done for about seven years now, is um, one of the more meaningful um, events that we do in council, at least for me. And I also want to take a moment um, to reiterate this. Um, I'm delighted to join my colleagues on council in proclaiming the second week of January to be Slavic and Eastern European Heritage Week. Our Slavic forefathers and foremothers helped build the city that we all know and love today. Today, around 50,000 Slavic immigrants live in the Portland metro area. And um, to this morning, we heard some of their stories, but their stories go back decades here in Portland. Now, the first wave of Slavic immigrants to arrive in Oregon came in the 1960s. Those folks settled around Woodburn, Oregon, and tended to take up farming. Now, a second wave of Slavic immigrants arrived in Oregon in the 1980s. 
this group uh, largely came to Portland uh, seeking religious freedom. Those folks tended to settle in East Portland, especially around the Foster, Powell, and Gateway neighborhoods. In fact, our Slavic and Eastern European neighbors have been a driving force behind East Portland's resiliency and renaissance. And as we march into the 21st century, um, I think today reminds us that our city needs our Slavic and Eastern European communities' ingenuity, innovation, and partnership more than ever. Um, you have a home here, um, and that is why I'm delighted to join all Portlanders in celebrating Slavic and Eastern European Heritage Week here in Portland. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner Maps. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to thank all of our guests for the excellent presentation today, and the stories were really incredibly compelling. Um, Svetlana, I just want to say thank you for sharing that deeply personal story of yours and your journey. Um, it really, it really resonated with me, and I know, I'm sure it's resonating with many other uh, uh, immigrants and refugees who have felt um, that very terrible feeling of rejection, but also the feeling of once you of coming home and finding your home. Um, so. Thank you for uh, for sharing that with us. Um, as one of the largest uh, of our refugee communities in Multnomah County, uh, this proclamation is a really, really important way to lift up and honor this community and all the vast personal sacrifices that have been made and also the contributions that have been made into our city um, in, in Portland and in also in Oregon. And, and again, it's worth saying that we should be lifting up and acknowledge Slavic and Eastern European communities and contributions and needs beyond just this week, it should be the way that we operate um, every single day. And according to uh, a report from the Coalition of Communities of Color, uh, the Slavic and Eastern European community is faced with some of the largest issues um, in our region, uh, primarily because of invisibility and marginalization that stems from the lack of um, uh, data from their experiences as a newer community here, particularly in the school system, um, in the criminal and juvenile justice system, health and social services, um, et cetera. So we all have a responsibility to serve uh, this community better. And beyond that, we have a responsibility to elevate and, and lift up um, European and Eastern European and Slavic leadership, and also advocate for policy and decisions that improve their community outcomes. So with all that's happening in the world, um, that's why this presentation is important as a reminder for us. And it's also important that we remember our responsibility in that longer story uh, to ensure that there, there's always representation and inclusion of Slavic and Euro Eastern European community in all of our policy and civic work. So again, just thank you for being here and for reminding us all today. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Gonzalez. I just want to say Portland is stronger because of the contributions from our Slavic and Eastern European communities, their dedicated work ethic, entrepreneurial spirit, and family-focused spirits make our city one of a kind. They also have many good soccer players who I've played with and against on the fields of Portland for years, and, and now my children are getting that same experience. Um, while many arrived to our city as immigrants, we recognize that countless have arrived as refugees from various wars and conflicts over the decades, from the dark shadows of communism and totalitarianism states is often through the eyes of immigrants that despite our own faults, we can truly appreciate the potential, the dream that is America. We, we recognize the ongoing turmoil, loss of life and suffering in Ukraine. We call for peace and prosperity once again in the region. This week, we celebrate the contributions and spirit of this community per particularly pronounced in East Portland. We are grateful to have many members of this community working hard for Portlanders day in and day out. I'd like to highlight the work of one in particular, an employee in our community health assessment treatment team chat within Portland Fire. Joining us online today is Puvel Prestaki. Uh, Puvel works tirelessly each day to address low acuity medical calls across the city, giving our residents peace of mind and operations operating a crucial part of our first responder network. But thank you, Puva. Portland is better with you here. It's my honor to recognize Portland's Slavic and Eastern European community this week and every week. Thank you. 
Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Ryan. Yes, thanks. Um, Svetlana, Svetlana, sorry, I want to get your name right. Thank you so much. And the people who join you, Irina and Zoya, I I like when we do proclamations like this. And of course, before preparing for the meeting, I learn things that are important, remind myself that there's 150,000 uh, Slavic and Eastern European residents in our area, and you're such a big part of our fabric. But truly, it's listening to your stories like today that allow me to just be present with what I experience. And thank you, especially, uh, Svetlana, for your uh, storytelling. And it was very moving. Earlier, there was testimony and communication that you, that in these jobs, you care about people we can never know. And listening to the three of you just reminds me of that. And at the, we could have 150,000 stories that are quite compelling. And I want to um, acknowledge, uh, Zoya, thank you so much for being a teacher at Franklin High School. I was actually on the school board in Portland Public Schools when we made those investments. Uh, and it started at Kelly Elementary in the dual immersion so that it could move all the way up to Franklin High School. So to see someone like you in that role, teaching the students at Franklin is, is very personally uh, satisfying to me. I just want to take this moment to acknowledge the good work of ERCO. I know I went to your party last year. It was so fun. And thank you for reminding me it's coming up again soon. And to think that ERCO was founded in 1976 uh, is compelling to me just how far they have gone to be that welcoming uh, doormat for all of you to come into our community, to be held, to be seen, like we like you're hope feeling today that you're feeling seen and that you can continue to um, build your resilience so you, that you're a vibrant part of the Portland community in, in ways that my other colleagues already mentioned. Anyway, such a blessing to be here this morning and to hear your three stories. I appreciate you. Thanks. Thanks, Commissioner, and thanks, everybody. Today, uh, obviously, we're celebrating Slavic and Eastern European Heritage Week, and as Commissioner Ryan just said, it, it honors over 150,000 Portlanders of Slavic and Eastern European descent. So this is a significant portion of our community. Their diverse languages, their cultures, and their histories clearly enrich our city, and it makes it a more vibrant and inclusive place to live. And I appreciate that we take this moment every year to really reflect on that and understand the importance of it. And for this, we have the Slavic Empowerment Team to credit, and that includes, of course, uh, Svetlana Hadin, one of today's presenters. Uh, Svetlana, I, sh I share my colleagues' thanks to you for, uh, for really being personal about this and bringing your story forward. Obviously, that was not easy, but as Commissioner Rubio said, I know that there's a lot of people in this community who can relate very personally with what you said, and I, I think it's empowering for people to be able to hear your story and connect personally with what you're saying. And on the other hand, I think it's helpful for those of us who do not share these personal stories to better understand uh, the context and the frame with which you go through your daily life here in the city of Portland. So I really want to applaud you and thank you for that. Uh, frankly, your work and your team's work exemplifies the inclusivity that we aim to promote within the city. This is a, a, a really terrific example. The efforts of your group, and I would say many of our affinity groups within the city of Portland symbolize our tangible commitment to a diverse and welcoming environment for city employees. This week, we will all strive to recognize and celebrate the significant contributions of our Slavic and Eastern European neighbors. And, and I thank you all for the invitation right up front to do to attend the January 31st uh, Slavic event at ERCO. Uh, so once again, let's all keep working together to continue to embrace and championing the diversity that, that all of us agree strengthens our city. So with that, I'll read the proclamation on behalf of the city council. Whereas Slavic and Eastern European Americans are one of Portland's largest immigrant and refugee communities, communities with over 150,000 people in the greater Portland area. And whereas Slavic and Eastern European Portlanders can trace their ancestry to 15 different countries, the former Soviet Union 
and 14 Eastern European countries with unique languages, dialects, cultures, and histories. And whereas the city of Portland has many Slavic and Eastern European employees and a Slavic empowerment team that works to build a more inclusive and diverse workforce. And whereas the Slavic empowerment team shares culture, language, and art with city employees through celebrations, displays, and performances. And whereas the Slavic empowerment team collaborates with many diverse organizations in the greater Portland area. And whereas the city of Portland strongly aligns with international concerns as to hostilities, loss of life, and suffering in regions such as Eastern Europe and countries like Ukraine. And whereas Portland is a welcoming, inclusive, and sanctuary city that celebrates its growing diversity. And whereas the city of Portland is proud of its relationships with all members of Slavic and Eastern European communities and will continue to support their professional and economic advance. Now, therefore, I, Ted Wheeler, the mayor of the city of Portland, Oregon, the city of roses, do hereby proclaim January 8th through 15th, 2024 to be Slavic and Eastern European Heritage Week in Portland and encourage all residents to celebrate this week. And now, uh, Svetlana, as if you haven't worked hard enough for us this morning, I will now turn this back to you to read the proclamation in Russian. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your warm words. Поскольку американцы славянского и восточноевропейского происхождения являются одной из самых больших общин иммигрантов и беженцев Кортленда, насчитывающей более 100 150 тысяч человек, которые проживают в Портленде и его окрестностях. И поскольку портландцы славянского и восточноевропейского происхождения своими корнями уходят в 15 стран бывшего Советского Союза и 14 восточноевропейских стран с их уникальными языками, диалектами, культурой и историей. И поскольку в городской управе Портленда трудятся многие, много сотрудников славянского и восточноевропейского происхождения. И есть славянская инициативная группа, которая формирует более инклюзивный и разнообразный рабочий коллектив. И поскольку славянская инициативная группа продвигает культуру, язык и искусство среди сотрудников городской управы путем проведения праздничных мероприятий, выставок и представлений. И поскольку славянская инициативная группа сотрудничает с многочисленными разнообразными организациями в Портленде и его окрестностях. И поскольку городская управа Портленда однозначно разделяет международную озабоченность по поводу военных действий, гибели и страданий людей в таких регионах, как Восточная Европа и таких странах, как Украина. И поскольку Портленд – это гостеприимный, инклюзивный город-убежище, где чевствует растущее разнообразие, и поскольку городская управа Портленда гордится своими отношениями со, со всеми членами славянской и восточноевропейской общины и продолжит оказание поддержки их профессиональному и экономическому продвижению. Поэтому я, Тед Уиллер, Мэр города Портленда, штат Орегон, города Росс, настоящим провозглашаю вторую неделю января 2024 года недели, недели славянской, славянского и восточноевропейского наследия. В Портленде призываю всех жителей отмечать эту неделю. Thank you. Thank you, Svetlana. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it very much. We'll uh, move on to the next item on the time certain agenda. Keelan, please read items seven and eight together. Item seven, accept the City of Portland 2024 Federal Legislative and Regulatory Agenda. Item eight, accept the City of Portland 2024 State Legislative Agenda. Colleagues, today we're going to hear and then vote on the city's 2024 Federal Legislative and regulatory agenda, as well as the 2024 state legislative agenda. In early 2023, as you'll recall, council participated in a work session 
to discuss the draft agendas for the Office of Government Relations. And they worked with uh, our staffs as well as all of our bureaus to develop those recommendations. I appreciate our very robust conversation on the political landscape in Oregon, as well as in Washington, DC, as well as the city's federal and state priorities in 2024. Since then, the OGR team has continued to refine and revise those documents. As you'll recall, we were all very, very closely aligned in terms of what our priorities should be. I'd like to take a moment to thank the OGR team and acknowledge the time and work that went into developing as well as further refining the agendas that we have before us today. Today we'll vote so that our teams in Salem as well as in Washington DC can get to work on behalf of the city on our city priorities. I'll now, without further ado, turn this over to the Director of Office Government Relations, Sam Chase. Welcome, Director Chase, it's good to see you. Thank you so much and good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, again, my name is Sam Chase. I use he, him pronouns and I'm the Director of your Office of Government Relations. First, want to thank you, uh, Mayor and Commissioners. You and your staff have been actively engaged in setting the city's federal and legislative agendas. And as you know very well, the city faces unprecedented crises related to homelessness, the proliferation of deadly new drugs, behavioral health, livability, warming climate, much more. This is a historic time where collaboration between the federal, state, and local, local governments is, is of the utmost importance. And I'm proud of this council, which has worked together and through the Portland of, of uh, Office of Government Relations in ways that provide a model of collaboration for future councils to come, that sets forth a unified voice for the city, and sets the table to inspire others to lean in and join the city in finding meaningful and effective solutions to our biggest challenges. And over the past six months, as you mentioned, uh, Mayor, that the, our, our state and federal advocacy teams have worked with your staff and staff and bureaus across the city to get to this point in our agenda development process. In December, we met with you in a work session to go over the drafts of the state and federal agendas, as well as provide you an overview of the political landscapes our teams will be working with uh, to move these agendas forward. We also had the chance to provide you an overview of the other work in our bureau and highlight the ARPA funded grants opportunity advancement team that is helping bureaus across the city seek funding for vital priorities. We uh, appreciated the conversations and have since followed up with each of your offices. The agendas will provide our team the needed direction to advocate for positions on these issues and more as they engage in the upcoming short session in Salem with our congressional delegation here and in Washington, DC. One of our next steps is the yearly legislative breakfast on January 23rd. Uh, where Portland City Council will get a chance to meet with the Portland legislative delegation and discuss the city's state legislative agenda. We're meeting with you and your staff this week to prepare for discussions with the delegation and just really want to thank you and your staff for the partnerships in this work. Joining me here today are OGR's Niels Tilstrom, Deputy Director and Regional Liaison for OGR, and Jack Ariaga, our federal relations manager, and our state legislative team is hard at work in Salem, not attending the work session. They are attending legislative days, which is uh, uh, one of the um, kind of uh, actions that happen where the legislature convenes before the short session. So we are happy to uh, thank you once more, and we're happy to take any any questions. Colleagues, any questions? Very good. Uh, then that completes our presentation, does it, Sam? Yes, it does. Good. All right. So item number seven, that's a report. I'll entertain a motion to accept the report. So moved. Commissioner Maps moves. Can I get a second? Second. Commissioner Gonzalez seconds. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah. No, I know. I know. I know. I know. I'm out of practice. Do we have public testimony on the either item seven or eight? Uh, we do. We okay. have people signed up. Um, the first one is Edie, Todd. I don't think they're here, but we do have Claire okay. Stanfield with us. Great. Welcome, Claire. 
Hi, thank you. Sorry, I'm out walking my dog, so I pulled up really quick. Um, so my name is Claire, and I'm coming to y'all today as a student at Portland State University and a citizen of Portland. My hope is to testify in regards to the 2024 state legislative agenda released by you, Ted Wheeler. You, Ted Wheeler. Specifically, I want to address the agenda's key priority to regulate public consumption of controlled substances it is a common misconception that homelessness is a byproduct of substance use, one that whether intentional or not can distract from homelessness as a housing issue. According to the CDC and the American Addiction Center, substance misuse and substance use disorder is a symptom of the trauma and stress of living outdoors in public. Therefore, it is imperative to offer spaces where people experiencing comorbid substance use disorder and homelessness can take shelter in Portland. The behavioral Health Resource Center, a Multnomah County organization, was intended to be such a place. However, now Portlanders are forced to use outside the building or surrounding private businesses are now impacted, and these people seeking respite and resources are more heavily policed, fined, and displaced. To me, this agenda's prioritization of the public consumption of substances is just one example of how the city is intending to alleviate Portlanders' discomfort by applying a Band-Aid without addressing the wound. There is an urgent need for quality housing, yet millions of dollars are being poured into hostile architecture, encampment sweeps, and the $50 million contract with Urban Alchemy, the controversial California-based nonprofit for whose shelters are only prepared to accommodate about 500 of the roughly 6,000 homeless Portlanders for about six months each. If we do truly intend to adhere to the city's core values and the citywide racial equity goals and strategies, and we need to reallocate funding and prioritize quality, long-lasting housing options. No roaches, no mold, no abusive landlords for all Portlanders. And until we meet that need, we must resist the pattern of arresting and citing the majority Black, Brown, Indigenous, and disabled people surviving homelessness in the city and navigating the current bureaucracy of accessing our shelters, no matter how comfortable. No matter how uncomfortable it is for business development districts, for neighborhoods, and for us, this is a community effort and our discomfort will not be soothed with a Band-Aid. We need to get to the wound, and that wound is quality, housing, inequality. Thank you. Hey, hey thank you, Claire, and uh, I appreciate you doing this uh, from a place that doesn't look particularly warm and toasty, so uh, I especially appreciate that. Uh, I think you'll be surprised to hear we're probably not as far off as you think. Um, you're right that, that an enforcement mechanism in the absence of other things is performative. And so we, we've been very clear, broadly speaking, about what we need from the state legislature. And we need a bunch of different things. First of all, we need more public safety support. And I've worked with the governor on a partnership with the Oregon State Police and our local police, uh, because we do have an obligation as a municipal government to enforce our local laws and maintain public safety. But you are also right that that alone isn't sufficient. We also need treatment. And as you're probably well aware, being somebody who's, who's on top of these issues, our state is woefully lacking in terms of behavioral health services and substance use disorder treatment. And we are being very, very vocal about our demands that our legislature continue to address this issue and build on the efforts around Measure 110 and build on the efforts around creating more treatment options for people. And frankly, we also need more secure treatment options. Uh, it's very unfortunate that uh, if people are engaged in drug use that can lead to criminal activity they go to jail if they're not getting support in a uh, secure location then ultimately what will happen is they'll come back out on the streets and probably pick up pretty closely to where they left off so there, there's a lot of pieces to this that have to come together in a way that makes sense you'll see that from our legislative agenda it is not just punitive Although um, where we may disagree is I actually do want to hold drug dealers accountable. I want them off our streets and I want them removed from our vulnerable populations. I agree with you that drug use is not a significant cause 
of homelessness, it is the other way around, just as you suggest. That's that's what the data shows, that people who are living on the streets, the longer they are there, the more likely they are to be exposed to drug use and increasing behavioral health issues. So my, my view has always been in my driving philosophy is get people off the streets, out of the unsanctioned camps as quickly as possible and into a humane alternative uh, that would be the task sites or the SRB sites that the city has set up that gives everybody who walks through the door case management and then tailored individualized services. And it could be substance use disorder treatment. It could be behavioral health services. It could be job training. It could be basic public health services. And then connect them to housing that is specifically reserved for that population. And the good news is it's working. Um, there, there was That was quite an uphill battle to get those into place, but it is working. You're right, it's not at scale to address the number of people that are currently on the streets, but I'd, I'd like us to continue to push forward together. And the reason is the overall driver for me is that over 300 people died on our streets last year. And a good many of them died from substance use disorder. And so clearly the status quo of having people just live in unsanctioned camps. That's not working. It's not working for the people who are living on the streets. Um, and it's not working for the public at large because it obviously does create public safety, public health and environmental hazards for everybody in the community. So I don't think we're as far apart as as you may uh, you know, see, you, you may disagree on the part of enforcement and that's fine, but I hope on the other parts where we're in agreement, we can continue to work together. Commissioner Gonzalez. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just uh, one clarification point. Are we uh, hearing testimony on seven and eight separate or are is testimony on them together? Affirmative, together, we're, we're combining. Got it, got it. Okay, and so our comments, uh, uh, and just for those listening at home, it's both the federal and the, and the state legislative agendas. Um, you know, I, without quibbling too much, I, I do think we need to, assess any assumptions about what leads people to on the streets of Portland. And part of it is a terminology issue. Uh, uh, the difference between homelessness and unsheltered uh, and how they're used in ordinary use. I, I, I think the data does indicate that substance use disorder is a substantial cause of people being unsheltered on the streets of Portland, uh, as well as other behavioral health issues. Uh, there is no doubt that people are using it uh, heavy drugs at times to cope with some of the very negative effects of being on the streets. But I, I just want to be clear about the assumptions I make in looking at the data uh, when we look at the most visible manifestations of homelessness of those folks on our on our streets uh, in front of us. Uh, I, I do believe that the data shows substance use disorder is a is a material contributor there, not the only one, but a significant one. Um, I'll leave it at that for now. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, does that complete public testimony, Keelan? It does. Okay, very good. So we've already got an we have a motion and a second on item number seven. Please commence with the roll call. Rubio. I'm just going to say my remarks for both um, right now. So I just want to acknowledge the great work for of the whole government relations team in developing uh, these legislative agendas and the work um, that you took to meet with each of our offices. I know that's not an easy uh, job to do with so many things we all care about, um, but you did it uh, really great. Um, the priorities outlined here today will help invest in housing stabilization and our economic recovery, and we'll put focus on aligning all the jurisdictions into this work. Um, and I just wanna particularly lift up a couple of things I'm excited about. Um, the, the potential positive outcomes if we're successful uh, to advocate for federal and state funding for our larger district scale developments like the Broadway Corridor Project, also the OMSI districts, um, and also Lower Albina and Lloyd Center. Um, these projects could potentially create thousands of housing units and investments in the infrastructure for them will help really 
push them towards becoming really complete communities with the mix of income housing with business opportunities and also uh, thousands of construction jobs. So very excited to know that the governor and the legislature are considering um, setting, you know, have all these considerations in mind and are setting aside potentially um, a large pot of money for these kinds of investments. And we're hoping that the federal uh, partners can get behind them as well. So again, just thank you for the presentation. And we're, as usual, we're always here to help with any uh, needs uh, to back you up in, in, in these agendas. I vote aye. I am. Yes, I want to start off by thanking you, Director Sam Chase, uh, truly under, and your entire team, under your leadership, I have really experienced a lot of improvement. So thank you so much for your leadership. I will say that in my three and a half years here, this is the most excited I've been about our uh, federal and state uh, legislative agenda. I have seen a slow, it's been too slow in my opinion, but we're seeing that alignment come together. I'm hearing state legislators, state executives, and even members of Congress sounding a little bit more like all of us as they are admitting the truth of the challenges that we are experiencing here in Portland on our streets. I'm really grateful for this momentum. The city cannot do it alone. The city, and yes, the county, cannot address the crisis on our streets without the help from our partners at the state and the federal level. This is a general agenda reflects the priorities of our city and the priorities for Portlanders. We need safe streets free of public drug use. We need to address our mental and our drug crisis. Basically, we need to keep our streets clean so we can activate them more frequently. And let me add, we need to invest more in the arts. I had a great meeting yesterday with Represent Representative Rob Nose, and I think it's important that we look at that alignment as well. It's the most reliable and dependable activator of the economy, and we must do all we can to get people back out and activate our streets and our performance halls with joy and celebration. With that in mind, I just want to say thank you again to Sam, to you and your team. Buckle up. I know it'll be a really busy uh, couple months, and I vote aye. Zealous. I'll combine my comments. Uh, today, I'm happy to accept both the federal and state uh, regulatory agenda. Among other important topics on the federal side addressed in the report uh, include economic recovery and development, homelessness and housing stability, infrastructure investment. I'm eager to see our uh, Oregon congressional delegation assist with FEMA uh, assistance to firefighter grants and other emergency personnel. Uh, only by working together, we can make sure that Portland continues to be a city we are proud of. Uh, I know that a lot of the work was put in on the federal side by OGRs uh, led by Director Chase and uh, Jack Ariaga. I hope I got that right, Jack. Uh, thank you for both your leadership. Now, on the state side, there are a number of key uh, components to this that I, I hope folks are uh, listening to. Again, I want to allude to the regulation of public consumption of controlled substances. Uh, this last summer, uh, the city council banned uh, 5.0 uh, public consumption of hard drugs. Uh, we are looking for either a, uh, a solution on the preemption question there uh, that we face at the state level or even better, uh, statewide response to the challenge, uh, including a recriminalization of certain uh, consumption or possession. Uh, but that's only one side of it, and I, I do agree with uh, the mayor's earlier comments. Uh, we It's absolutely essential that we have increased uh, state support for mental and behavioral health services, stable, stabilizing bed prioritized for individuals transported uh, by first responders, Streamlining and expediting the siting of behavioral health residential treatment facilities, funding for ODOT to effectively manage a litter and campus and graffiti on state owned property, and continued Oregon State presence in Portland to help with traffic enforcement capacity and additional law enforcement presence. Uh, formerly, uh, last but not least, on that area, funding. Uh, formula updates and allocation of resources to address cuts to the community corrections budget. This is really on the county side, but it very much affects the city in our abilities to address crime in our community. Uh, with respect to housing and homelessness, securing ongoing state funding to support the setup and operations of tasks and safe rest villages, accelerating the development 
affordable uh, and workplace housing, including supporting the call for infrastructure funding for major redevelopments like sites at Broadway Corridor, OMSI, Albina, and making office conversion projects eligible for funding streams. Uh, streamlining process for states home buyer opportunity limited tax exemption, and then legislation programs and funding to help make commercial to residential conversions more affordable. I do want to call out, I think, um, in, in looking close hand at the challenges that the mayor's team and our um, city attorney's office has faced in addressing unsanctioned camping on the streets of Portland. I, I hope that we have a space for future priorities to pursue uh, the, the preemption question, clear authority from the state for city to establish potentially municipal courts down the road, a road uh, to address uh, the prosecution of misdemeanors, drug related misdemeanors, uh, and other uh, charter ordinance violations. Uh, we're the only city in the state that faces preemption in this area, and it's something that we need to look at down the road. Uh, more explicit authority on what the state defines as reasonable. Uh, we are, with respect to unsanctioned camping regulations, we are preempted in this area as a city. We are limited in what we can do, and it's created substantial challenges, again, for the mayor's team, for our city attorney, and navigating that, we are currently enjoined and enforcing our own um, time, place, manner restriction. Uh, and these are, in some ways, challenges created by our state legislature that we need their help in fixing. Uh, clear definition regarding derelict RVs, how to change the ability to tow along state routes, city streets, and addressing the crisis of pretrial release uh, and updating the matrix for additional clarity to limit the ability of suspects of violent crimes to quickly return to the streets. I wanna be very specific about this. This particularly manifests itself on early release of those committing property crimes. We think there's a direct correlation between property and some of the more serious crimes. Uh, that includes drug dealers. And uh, again, this is an area where there's been recent state legislation that I think is impacting our court's ability to confront the challenges on our street. Sorry for the long winded uh, uh, comments here. I vote to approve the report. Oops. Hi. Miller. Yeah, I just want to thank government relations for, for hearing all of us out. Uh, colleagues, I'm just really pleased that we're unified on this agenda. This is a, a thick agenda. Uh, we have held together uh, on our broad priorities, which is to address homelessness, to address public safety, to address livability, and to address our economic recovery. We are unified in terms of what we need from our state legislature during this short session upcoming, as well as the full session next year. And uh, the bottom line is we are doing everything we can at the local level. And I'm proud of the actions, the concrete actions that we have taken to address these issues on our streets. But the bottom line is that we and other municipal governments around the state cannot do the work alone. We need the behavioral health services that the state funds. We need the substance use disorder treatment as you know, we heard from our testifier earlier today. And again, that is funded at the state and the county level, not at the municipal level. And as Commissioner Gonzalez eloquently stated, we are preempted on a whole host of fronts of doing things that we have the courage, the desire, the willingness, and the resources to implement or enforce, but we are blocked from doing so by uh, preemption at the legislative level. So there's a lot of areas here where we can show real progress and we can leverage the programs that we already have in place if we have support from our state legislature. And so we're all gonna continue to fight uh, in a unified way on these items. We've agreed to do that. I'm really proud that we're working together and I vote aye. And so the report is accepted on item seven. On item eight, I will accept a motion to accept the report. I move. Commissioner so Ryan, I think, moves. Can yeah. I get a second, please? Second. Commissioner Mapp seconds. Any further discussion on the report? Seeing none, please call the roll. Keelan. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Dallas. Aye. Aye. Miller. Aye. The report is accepted. We'll now move to the regular agenda. Item number 20, please.
Authorize city attorney to pres uh, pursue review by writ of mandamus of the opinion and order on plaintiff's motion for a preliminary injunction issued in Duncan v. City of Portland. Uh, colleagues, this is a lot more interesting than the title would suggest. Last fall, we voted on and we passed a change to our city public camping code to include reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions. This was in response to state law, specifically House Bill 3115, that required reasonable restrictions on public camping. The Oregon Law Center promptly sued the city, as is their right, and asked Multnomah County Circuit Court to issue a preliminary injunction. The judge granted that injunction and prohibited the city from enforcing the ordinance that council passed. We requested that the judge issue an order explaining the rationale for her decision as is required by Oregon law. She has not responded to that request. Therefore, I ask the city attorney's office to pursue an appeal by seeking a writ of mandamus from the Oregon Supreme Court. Portlanders deserve to know why the city is prevented from enforcing this ordinance. They deserve the clarity required to allow us to find urgent solutions and respond to the crisis. This resolution confirms our commitment to moving forward with urgency and aims to hold the legal system accountable to the rules. Nonetheless, while we stand behind the ordinance as passed, and while we feel confident in our legal standing, we also maintain the right to issue a new ordinance that takes into consideration the plaintiff's concerns. So as we pursue these appeals, which we believe are just, my team and I have simultaneously been preparing a potential new ordinance that we think could address the concerns raised in court. I am fully prepared to bring a new ordinance to council if the courts don't respond to our requests in the coming weeks. And colleagues, the timeline is not up to us, it is up to the courts. Turning to the resolution before us, we have City Attorney Robert Taylor, Deputy City Attorney Naomi Sheffield, and my Senior Policy Advisor, Skylar Brockernap, to present the information as well as to answer questions. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, for the record, uh, I'm Robert Taylor. I'm the City Attorney. Uh, Mayor, I think your, your uh, presentation and description uh, accurately recounts the procedural history here and also the arguments that we have made uh, made in court. Um, we, we did pursue this writ of mandamus to the Supreme Court. We're asking the Supreme Court to do two things. First, to please direct the trial court to uh, issue an opinion explaining the reasons for her injunction. And then second, we are asking the Oregon Supreme Court to please direct the trial court to limit her injunction to allow the city to enforce the manner regulations. Our request to the Supreme Court through this writ of mandamus, it's an extraordinary request. It's something that the Supreme Court has ultimate discretion whether or not to, to grant. Um, it is our 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 opportunity to ask the court to do that, but they do have discretion. Uh, and I do think it is uh, it is in the city's interest to try to get some um, more detailed feedback from the courts to help us inform what we can and cannot do as a city. And that is why we took this step. And with uh, this resolution, council would authorize our office to continue that effort at the Oregon Supreme Court. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Robert, uh, I think the mayor indicated that we don't necessarily control the timelines here. On the other hand, do, do we have any expectation about how quickly um, the higher courts might move on this? Is this a matter of days, weeks, months, years? You know, I, 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 it is hard to predict, uh, and the Oregon Supreme Court has discretion over the timeline. Typically, they would respond to these things in in, in relatively quick fashion. So uh, we, you know, I, every day I come into the office, I sort of 
think maybe today will be the day we'll get a decision one way or another, but you know, it, it can take time. Okay. And then of course, depending on what the Supreme Court does, it may give the trial court some additional time to 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 respond. So um we're, we're we are sort of in a holding pattern, but we do think we're we're we are doing the right thing by trying to get some direction from a court. And and we may not, you know, we may end up where we are right now, which is with an injunction uh uh with without further reasoning and and then we're going to have to adjust to that also. Uh okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that clarification. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. I have more of a comment um and also just a little bit of an additional proposal uh to uh the mayor's suggestion that that he he put on the table that I'd like to make as well. And first, I'll just say thank you, Robert, for taking the time to walk us through some of these pieces too in the last few days. Um, it's evident to me that people want to see change as it relates to uh, the impact that this is having on businesses and community. And it's also clear to me that people in Portland expect the city to strike that balance between being humane in our treatment of those who live outside and also having clean and clear, accessible streets. Um, so I'm going to vote yes on this, um, but not necessarily because I believe we've found that balance yet, but because with this writ, um, I really support seeking that extra information from the court about why specifically the, the court found um, or what was legally wrong that they found um, that uh, with the ordinance that we uh, previously or that was previously passed. Um, I also believe that it's um, a crucially important piece of information for us to have before we do anything else in order that we move forward with a policy that strikes that balance. And at the same time um, that we're seeking answers to that question, um, I'd like to talk about a parallel path potentially. Um, as you might remember, I introduced amendments to the ordinance and ultimately voted no. And as I stated then, and I think it's worth repeating, um, I believe it's important to have a process that is inclusive of key system partners, including shelters, law enforcement, experts, and others to arrive at a solution um, that is more reflective of what we're seeing on the ground and also that is inclusive of those um, other pieces of expertise um, and not divisive. And so on that note, I'm hoping we can have a conversation that includes all these active system partners who were not previously brought along with the original ordinance um, to think through what a prompt solution to public camping issues face, face the city right now. My hope is that we find another way forward that like the mayor said, we can repeal the current policy that's in legal question and replace it with something that will ensure a human centered solution while still meeting the intent of the policy, especially for our community members with disabilities and that will also stand up to judicial scrutiny. Um, and we all know that, you know, legal processes can take a long time. Um, and at the same time, Portlanders want us to respond and act expeditiously. Um, and I, I really do believe that we can find a, a new and, and innovative solution. Um, we've, we've learned some things um, thus far um, that I think are really important things to talk about. Um, and also, um, if we repeal it and replace it, the current ordinance with one, um, that we work on together, we might do that. It allows the city to act faster, potentially, than the legal process. And I think we can get there soon. We, I don't think we have anything to lose by having the conversation and exploring this together. So um, it's just a long-winded way of saying, uh, Mayor, I support what you're putting on the table, and I would love to add um, those other dimensions to explore as well. Thank you, Commissioner. Appreciate it. Commissioner Gonzalez. Yeah, I think uh, Commissioner Ruby hits out one important theme. I, I do disagree with a component of this, uh, of her comments. Uh, I'll, maybe I'll start with the part I disagree with on the mayor's team proceeded in an incredibly thought out, from my vantage point, sometimes too slow a process to uh, propose this original ordinance, to do outreach before enforcement. They jumped through numerous hoops over numerous hurdles uh, and then to get at the end of it uh, and face a one page injunction without any clear explanation is deeply problematic from a public policy process. And um, at all at the same time, Portlanders are fed up and the parts of our town that are facing the most negative impacts 
of unsanctioned camping, of RVs, are often our most marginalized communities. They are often our, low, our lowest income neighborhoods. It's not just businesses downtown. Our entire city is feeling the impacts of unsanctioned camping. Um, and so this is a difficult area from a legal perspective to navigate. We've got Ninth Circuit law. We've got a well-intentioned statute that I think is having some really negative unintended consequences for cities trying to navigate it. And we have a citizenry that is lost their patience, rightfully so. Um, so I, um, it's probably the portion I, I, I disagree with on um, that I, I felt like the, the mayor's team did pursue a deliberate process on this. Uh, and, and, and frankly, I was often one of the ones arguing for them to speed it up and to get at the end of this uh, to face what we face. We have to pursue this uh, aggressively. We also have to address it uh, in Salem, uh, unfortunately. Um, but I do agree with you dovetailing the law enforcement with the behavioral health and shelter solutions there's this is not just a, a law enforcement solution to these problems we do have to bring them both together uh and, and um i just am concerned that we when we go through deliberate processes that are excessively uh slow um we are not responding to the crisis on our streets and for 40 plus years the city of portland had the right to ban unsanctioned camping that was an old uh, city ordinance that goes back to 82, we dramatically watered it down in a response to state law. Uh, again, that wasn't new law. We banned camping here uh, for 40 plus years in the city of Portland. And I think there's evidence that, that actually the banning on outdoor camping predates the 82 ordinance uh, in, in the city of Portland. Uh, but nonetheless, we watered it down after deliberate process and then still to get the end to the end and to be enjoined from enforcing uh, I think Portlanders are, have, have been more than patient on this. That's all. Thank you, Commissioner Gonzalez. Commissioner uh, Rubio. No. I appreciate your comments, uh, Commissioner Gonzalez. And um, I do not disagree with a lot of what you said. I, I want to clarify that I in no way stated that the mayor's office did not do a diligent job. I believe that they did. I believe that... Um, you know, this was a new concept for everybody. And, and um, but we can't also disagree or we can't also, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, deny that some people did not feel brought along or maybe just at the speed that this was going uh, and the urgency that it required. Um, I think that we've learned some things since then. So I just want to clarify, um, I really appreciate the, the mayor's staff approach to this and their diligent work to get us this far. And I also think it's okay for us to take a look and see how it's going and, and to see if there's anything new to learn from what we know so far um, and make it even better. So that's all. Thank you. All right, very good. Uh, any further questions? questions or comments on this before I call for public testimony? Keelan, do we have public testimony? No one signed up. All right, very good. This is a resolution. Please call the roll. Rubio. I want to thank the mayor and his team for their hard work that they put into this and engaging with my office on all of our questions. And I also want to thank the city attorney's office as well for their help in walking us through our questions as well. Um, I vote aye. Um, I hope that our legal team can continue their job to get the information from the courts that we need. Ryan. Yes, uh, thank you for this thoughtful action. I appreciate they were reading the room, the room called Portland. I vote aye. Gonzalez. Uh, we originally need to address the humanitarian crisis on our streets have months of, after months of preparing in good faith to meet the rules and guidelines around enforcement. We remain unable to act due to court action. Challenging this decision at the highest level in our state is a step we must take and which I fully support in order to get those in need to critical services and temporary shelters, as well as restore the commons so that they remain safe and accessible for all Portlanders. I also believe we must at the same time address this issue at the state legislature that I have now mentioned a couple of times uh, during the upcoming session. In addition to other critical issues, the city is preempted by the state from taking action on, such as open hard drug use prohibitions. With that, I vote aye. Yes. 
Aye. Aye. So first of all, I want to thank my team and the city attorney's office for their diligent work addressing the issues Portlanders are most concerned about. Uh, in particular, I want to call out Skylar Brocker Knapp from my team who did a considerable amount of outreach and meetings and communications with community stakeholders to make sure that we got a broad perspective as we put this together. I will continue to do everything I can to advocate for urgent action to effectively, as well as compassionately address homelessness on our streets. Over the course of the last three months, we have now housed 200 people from our TAS and Safe Rest Village sites. We are innovating and leading to connect homeless Portlanders with the services they desperately need to get off and stay off the streets. I'm committed to pressing forward and implementing an ordinance that meets the needs of Portlanders. Whether that is achieved through the legal system or through modified ordinances, I will not stop pushing against the status quo. And a reminder, the status quo has led to over 300 deaths on our street in the last calendar year. I vote aye, the resolution is adopted. Thank you, colleagues. We'll move on to uh, item 21, also a resolution, please. Adopt the budget calendar for FY 2024-25. Colleagues, each year, as you know, the council approves the budget calendar for the coming fiscal year. The City Budget Office Director Tim Grew and Deputy Director Ruth Levine have joined us here today to talk us through the calendar. Welcome Director Grew and Deputy Director Levine. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. For the record, Tim Grew, City Budget Officer. I would like to just briefly run through some of the changes that you will see in this, um, in this uh, resolution on the budget process. Um, first of all, the requested budgets are due three weeks later than normal on February 16th, instead of the usual end of January date. And this was to provide more time for the bureaus to adjust um, their budgets based upon much of what's happening in terms of the translate, uh, transition to the new form of government. Second, the work sessions were, are moved up to February to give council an opportunity to hear about the key financial issues and give input in the service areas requested budgets. The work sessions that we're speaking of here will provide council with an opportunity to have a brief overview of the budgets for each service area. Also, um, where applicable, information will be provided on the actions taken by the service areas in response to budget constraints and other revenue issues. Responses will also be provided on the key financial issues that have been presented in the budget guidance memo too. And finally, an overview will be provided of any significant organizational changes that are being implemented within the requested budgets and the work that needs to be done in implementing those changes. The third change in the budget process is that utility rate hearings are moved to an earlier time, March 5th, to provide more certainty to the utilities um, on their rates and in some cases their fees. This aligns with the budget note that council adopted in the 23-24 budget. Beginning with the release of the mayor's proposed budget on May 2nd, the budget calendar dates before you today largely are determined by the mandates established by the Oregon State Budget Law and are similar to the dates we've had in prior fiscal years. Due to the dynamic nature of the budget process, particularly that this is a transitional budget process, these dates may be subject to changes based upon council's preferences. If those changes do occur, the city budget office will communicate those dates to the council and bureaus, as well as to the general public. Mr. Mayor, we're available to respond to any questions on the budget process. Thank you. Very, very good. Thank you. Colleagues, any questions on the budget calendar as proposed? Keelan, do we have any testimony on this resolution? We do. We have one person signed up. All right, let's hear him. Vince Masiello. Welcome, Vince.
Vince, you're muted. Vince, are you able to unmute? It looks like they may be having some technical difficulties. All right. Well, so, sorry about that, Vince. Um, oh. Keelan, please call the roll. Mayor, you know what? They may right. have just connected. Uh, Let me. All right. Vince, can you hear us? Let's see. Nope. I, I think they dropped off. Okay, that's too bad. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Please call the roll on the resolution. Rubio. I want to thank uh, Tim and Ruth for bringing the budget calendar forward. It's an important step for maintaining transparency in our budget process. I vote aye. Aye. So thank you, Tim and Ruth. It makes sense to me to move the timeline to set deadlines one month sooner than in the past. I imagine that extra time will be very beneficial during the transition. I vote aye. Gonzalez. I vote aye. Epps. Aye. Miller. All right. The resolution is adopted. Item number 22, an emergency ordinance. Approve revisions to the human resources administrative rule for gender identity and non-discrimination. And colleagues, just a heads up, we'll take a brief break after this item. This ordinance amends Human Resources Administrative Rule 2.04 in accordance with feedback from the, that the city received through bargaining units, employee resource groups, and bureau stakeholders to better align our code with our core values. These changes update language regarding sanitary and gender-specific facilities, name and pronoun use, dress code clarifications, privacy standards, and more. Christina Badenreck from the Bureau of Human Resources and Aubrey Kian from the Office of Equity and Human Rights are here to walk us through the item. Welcome, Christine and Aubrey. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Thank you for allowing us to present today. My name is Christina Fadenreck, she, her pronouns, and I'm a Senior Policy and Program Analyst for the Bureau of Human Resources. And I am here with my colleague, Aubrey Chen, and she is getting our presentation going. Uh, she is an LGBTQIA2 plus analyst with the Office of Equity and Human Rights. Okay. I think we're having some technical difficulties, excuse me. My apologies, uh, Zoom decided to crash as soon as I shared my presentation. Give me one moment. Here comes something. There it is. <sighs> Wonderful. Okay, today we are bringing an amendment to Human Resources Administrative Rule 2.04 for gender identity and non-discrimination for you to consider approving. I'll share a brief overview of the rules or HRARs as we refer to them. And Aubrey will highlight the history and purpose of the rule as well as the revision process. And I'll conclude with a summary of the updates and resources we can look forward to. And because this is my first time with you for a formal rule revision request, I'm gonna take the time to refresh everyone with what the human resource administrative rules are and what that process typically looks like. So HRARs are the policy and procedures that help guide the employee experience and they apply broadly to all employees throughout our organization. Our goal is to align them with the core values that you've adopted for the city, as well as the Bureau of Human Resources values, including involvement, diversity development, accountability, stewardship, and creativity. And we are responsible for managing a citywide review for each of these updates. And this follows a process outlined in the HRARs. And new for this year, I'm happy to share that an internal HRAR policy advisory committee has been established so that employees can collaborate and provide feedback on the 91 rules that were in need of 
and updating. And as you know, with the transition to the new form of government, uh, we will have some updates. And I plan to report back to you um, in the coming year on the work of that committee. Uh, we are still having some difficulties. I apologize with our presentation. Um, I, I will share along those materials if you're interested after today. Uh, and with that, Aubrey, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you. Uh, my apologies uh, for these technical difficulties. Um, uh, so briefly, I will go over the history and purpose of the HRAR 2.04 Gender Identity and Non-Discrimination. Uh, this ordinance or this rule was initially adopted by City Council in March of 2002 uh, with the purpose of pro prohibiting discrimination on the basis of gender identity and gender expression. Um, this rule was last revised in April of 2016. It is important to note uh, that the city of Portland operationalized our commitment to LGBTQ equity by establishing the LGBTQIA 2S plus equity program in 2021. As part of the establishment of our program, one of our primary directives has been to review and revise any policies within the city of Portland in order to better serve our LGBTQIA 2S plus community and LGBTQIA 2S plus uh, Portlanders. Uh, briefly, I'm going to review several of our reasons for revision. Uh, one of our primary goals was to make sure that our uh, revisions were in alignment with city core values. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, secondarily, uh, one of our goals was to better protect employee health, uh, life, and safety. Uh, additionally, our goals are to revise outdated language to be more inclusive of all identities within the city's diverse workforce. Um, as part of our 2023 uh, workforce census, uh, our, work percent, our workforce census found that 4% of Portland's uh, city staff identify as transgender, non-binary, genderqueer, or gender fluid. Um, in addition to these revisions, our intent has been to improve the administrative processes to meet transition requests in a timely and complete manner and clarify and add information for understandability in order to better serve and operationalize LGBTQIA 2S plus equity. Uh, if we can move to the previous slide, please. Um, I'm going to briefly go over our engagement timeline. Uh, in 2022, uh, the Office of Equity and the Human uh, and Human Rights of the Bureau of Human Resources and the Queer Alliance Employee Resource Group began collaboration on revising content uh, within the HRAR 2.04. Through the summer and fall of 2023, our Bureau and Office stakeholders held meetings and began these revisions and continue to refine uh, our policy proposals. Um, this version was presented uh, to city labor leadership uh, on November 2nd. And then uh, a notice of open comment period was provided to city employees from November 20th to December 4th. Uh, feedback from city, leader, city labor leadership and employees was incorporated into the version of the revised rules that you see today. Uh, hopefully upon passage of these revisions, our intent is to continue working on the implementation of these rules and provide training to city staff in order to make sure that our commitment to LGBTQIA 2S plus equity is operationalized. Uh, next, I'll pass it on to Christina to talk about uh, some of our revisions. Thank you, Aubrey. And now I would like to discuss the proposed changes, and these can really be categorized into three parts here. Uh, we have added terminology, uh, new standards for transition-related updates and requests, and additional resources. First, we have the updated language to now include definitions for outing, misgendering, and dead naming. And the inclusion of these terms in the policy can help equip employees with a better understanding of how to respect each other's identities and what exactly constitutes harassment and discriminatory behavior. And second, we have new standards to protect employees. We have added a new privacy section to prevent the intentional outing of an employee and added language to support the commitment to gender affirming and culturally competent healthcare coverage and direction for updating employee records to timely reflect any name changes and identity markers in our systems. And next slide, please. And lastly, the addition of resources includes a model guidance plan that serves as a sample tool that employees and managers and supervisors can reference if they are requesting a workplace transition plan. And following an adoption, 
a training plan will be developed for all city employees to reference when they're requesting to go through this process. In addition, in the interim, several related rules, including HR AR 2.02, uh, our harassment policy, 4.03 for our dress code policy, our workplace violence policy, and our discipline policy can be referenced in support of this role. And our offices of equity and human rights and the Bureau of Human Resources will be available to assist with any questions in the process. And that concludes our presentation. Uh, we would like to open it up to you for any questions or discussions you have for consideration. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, colleagues. Any questions at this point? Not seeing any great presentation. Akila, do we have anybody signed up for public testimony? No. All right. This is an emergency ordinance. Please call the roll. Yes. I first want to appreciate all the incredible staff work that went into these changes and also want to really appreciate and take a moment to say that it's really just not today, but we're looking at decades of courage and advocacy by not only current staff, but former staff and community that has all led up to this point of being seen and being acknowledged and codified. So in that way, I just want to thank all our staff who um, who uh, to, had what it takes to get us to this point today. I strongly support um, the continued refinement of all of our rules and practices to make sure that we are aligned with our city core values and ensure that we treat all employees inclusively, equitably, and with respect. So thanks again for bringing these changes forward and I'm full. I'm in full support of this work. I vote aye. I am. Yes, uh, well, thank you, Christina and Aubrey. That was a great presentation. I couldn't be happier to see this come to council this morning. I'd like to give a big, big thank you to the team who put this together, namely Lex Janikowski. I know that you were heavily involved. Aubrey and the hardworking folks at the Queer Alliance Deep Group. Aubrey, we had a chance to meet recently, and I just want to thank you again for the good work that you are doing on behalf of our city employees. You know, today marks a significant moment in history of our city where we embrace not just a policy change, but a shift in our collective consciousness towards greater inclusivity and equality. We celebrate the amendment of our human resource code to be more inclusive of the queer community. We are affirming our commitment to every individual's right to be recognized, respected, valued, and seen. This change is more than just an update of words. It's a reflection of our city's heart and soul. By making our human resource code more inclusive, we are taking a tangible step towards ensuring that our LGBTQI plus residents are not just seen, but are also heard and are fully supported. Let's continue to work together with compassion and conviction to build a Portland that truly embodies the spirit of inclusivity for all. Well done. I vote aye. Gonzalez. I vote aye. Thanks. Um, I want to thank the mayor for bringing this item forward, and I want to thank staff for their uh, diligent and excellent work on this item. I vote aye. Miller. We want to set a positive example for a workplace where all people who live here in the city of Portland can see themselves as being part of our team. And this work is central to that. I wanna thank all of you who worked so hard on this. I know there's a lot of behind the scenes work that went into this, a lot of outreach, a lot of communication, and um, it almost feels anticlimactic bringing it to council and then just having a brief conversation and taking a quick vote. But uh, I want you to know that all of us on this council, we see you and we see the work that you did. We appreciate it. I'm very happy to vote aye and the ordinance passes. Colleagues, we've been here for a couple hours now. Why don't we give everybody a 10 minute recess? Why don't we reconvene, please? Uh, it's, it looks to my slightly off clock to be about 1132. Let's reconvene at about 1142. We're in recess. Thank you.
Price agreements with Hicks Striping and Curbing LLC and Specialized Pavement Marking LLC to furnish on-call traffic striping and signing for $1 million per agreement. All right. So this report authorizes two price agreements for striping as well as signage services as part of the Portland Bureau of Transportation's Quick Build Delivery Program. And we're going to hear from Chief Procurement Officer Biko Taylor to present the item. And I, I hope, Biko, that you'll give us just a quick few sentences on what the Quick Build Delivery Program is. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mayor Wheeler and Commissioners. I'm Kathleen Brennis Marua, uh, Procurement Manager overseeing Design oh, Construction Contracting Services. Hi, Biko. Uh, was an, unable to be here this morning and asked um, so I am here to recommend authorization to enter into these on-call construction services contracts uh, for the traffic striping and signage with Hicks Striping and Curbing LLC and Specialized Paving Marking LLC. Um, and I apologize to your question. Uh, I'm not prepared to respond to PBOT's um, quick build uh, program, and I don't believe that we have a PBOT representative with us this morning. Uh, I just stepped in and uh, and unfamiliar um, with that project. All right, but, no worries. Um, um, City Council, thank you for stepping in. <laughs> All right, thank you. City Council approved ordinance number one nine one four two six on August twenty third of twenty twenty three, authorizing procurement services to competitively solicit for these services. The anticipated expenditure expenditure um, is five million per contract um, over a total of five years. Procurement services issued the invitation to bid on May 16th of 2023 with the due date of August 15, and two bids were received. Hicks striping and curbing and specialized pavement marking were responsive to the bid requirements. 
Um, price agreements for on-call construction services are intended to be used for projects whose the specific scope and budget are not predetermined, but rather work will be performed under these contracts. Um, as the need arises, they will be authorized via written task orders um, once those projects are identified. Um, our equity in contracting aspirational goal of 20% of the hard construction costs for subcontractor and supplier utilization, uh, firms certified by the State Certification Office for Business Inclusion and Diversity will apply to each individual task order and the two contractors awarded these price agreements have committed to make good faith efforts to achieve the utilization goal. Each task order will be negotiated um, to subcontract with co-bid certified enterprises to the maximum extent possible. Big Striping Curbing LLC is located in Salem, Oregon. Um, they have current city of Portland business and tax registration and full compliance with all the city's contract requirements as a specialized pavement marking LLC. And with that, I recommend um, approval uh, to proceed to contract with these two uh, construction firms. All right, thank you, Kathleen. Commissioner Maps. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to, number one, thank Kathleen for stepping in uh, um, on behalf of BICO today. I just wanted to quickly address your question about what the Quick Build program is. Lives over in Peabot. This is uh, a project for small capital projects, typically to improve uh, safety or to address some issues. So we're talking about things like bike lanes, safe routes to school, whatnot typically less than half a million dollars, very meat and potatoes. Uh, this is where our non-controversial, uh, uh, um, just making sure our systems are working effectively, um, projects tend to lift. Hey, thank you. I, I appreciate that. that. That sounds great. Yeah, it's a great program, uh, folks. It's it's very important uh, when you hear folks come to, to come to uh, council uh, to express their concerns about deficits in our transportation system, especially if it's hyper-specific, Often the way we address that is through this program. Awesome. All right. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Maps. Uh, colleagues, any questions for Kathleen, understanding that, that she is filling in today, so she may not have all the, the finer details. Seeing none, Keelan, do we have any public testimony on this item? No one signed up. All right. This is a report. I'll entertain a motion to accept the report. So moved. Commissioner Maps moves. Can I get a second, please? Second. Second, second from Commissioner Rubio. Please call the roll. Rubio. I want to thank Kathleen for being here today and for uh, presenting this work. Um, I vote aye. Brian. Yeah, good to see you, Kathleen. I vote aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Apps. I want to thank Kathleen for stepping in at the last minute. I want to thank my colleagues for supporting this program. As I mentioned in my uh, clarifying comments here, this is a very straightforward program that allows us to address things like crosswalks, uh, neighborhood greenways, biking uh, infrastructure and whatnot. Very important work, kind of small ball, but it's the kind of small ball that helps us uh, move our transportation goals forward, which is why I vote I. Miller. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to dig into this a little more. I think it's great, uh, Commissioner Maps, and I, I like the idea of prioritizing some of these smaller, non-controversial, easier to do sort of things without making them go through the full rigmarole uh, and, and many, many, many months of, uh, of process. I, I, I think this, this sounds like a great example of the Bureau trying to cut to the chase and get stuff done. So I'm, I'm strongly supportive of this. Uh, I uh, thank you, Kathleen, for filling in at the last minute. I vote aye, and the report is accepted. Next item, item 24, please, is an emergency ordinance. Pay settlement of Angelica Clark bodily injury lawsuit for $158,000 involving the Portland Police Bureau. Colleagues, this ordinance resolves a lawsuit that was brought against the city of Portland back in July of 2022. Deputy City Attorney Beth Woodward and Senior Claims Analyst Dave Farrow are here to walk us through this ordinance. Welcome. Good morning, Council. For the record, I'm Deputy City Attorney Beth Woodard. This lawsuit, uh, this settlement resolves uh, claims brought by Erica Clark for uh, injuries she sustained on July 26, 2020. And I have just lost my notes. Hold on one second. 
here we are. Uh, on the evening of July 25th, Ms. Clark participated in protests in downtown Portland near the federal courthouse. In the early hours of July 26, Portland police declared a riot and began dispersing the remaining crowd. Ms. Clark complied with dispersal orders and walked north on Southwest 4th Avenue as directed uh, by the officers. As the crowd walked north, a group of individuals began to throw fireworks towards the officers from a nearby parking deck just behind Ms. Clark. The line of officers then sped up and overtook Ms. Clark. She was pushed several times and pepper sprayed. She filed suit in federal district court alleging Fourth Amendment claims and state law claims for battery and negligence. The parties attended a judicial settlement conference in November and agreed to resolve this matter for $158,000, inclusive of Ms. Clark's economic and non-economic damages as well as her attorney fees. The city attorney's office and risk management recommend approval of the settlement. And at this time, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Colleagues, any questions? Seeing none, Keelan, do we have public testimony on this item? We do. We have six people. All right, very good. Uh, first up, we have Mark Porras, Portland Cop Watch. Hello, can you hear me? Loud and clear, Mark. Fantastic. Good morning, Mayor Commissioners. My name is Mark Porras. I use he, him pronouns. And I'm with Portland Cop Watch. Uh, we understand the parties have come to an agreement, and we have no objection to the city paying $158,000 to settle this bodily injury lawsuit resulting from the harm caused by three unnamed Portland police officers. We hope Ms. Clark's recovered from her physical injuries and that her resulting mental and emotional injuries will lessen with time. According to court records, which also contain photographic evidence, on the night of July 25, 2020, Ms. Clark, a Black woman, participated in a protest against police violence and in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. Around 2.15 a.m. on January 26, 2020, PPB officers repeatedly beat Ms. Clark as she followed orders to disperse. Court records state that one officer hit Ms. Clark with his baton and pushed her into a wall. Another officer hit her with his outstretched baton, and a third officer put his hand on her face, violently ripped off her mask and goggles, and pepper sprayed her directly into the eyes. This settlement raises the total, according to our records paid by the city for protests between 2018 and 2020, to more than $2,860,000, and as stated in the ordinance, the source of funding is the city's insurance and claims fund, which means none of the three officers will pay a cent of that to Ms. Clark for the harm they caused. Since the officers were not identified, it seems safe to assume that none of them received discipline for violating Ms. Clark's rights, and we have no reason to believe that they'll be excluded from participating in the next iteration of the Bureau's riot squad. We appear before you on police brutality settlements, hoping you will discuss the policy decisions that lead to these incidents, as well as changes you're willing to propose in order to hopefully someday enable the Bureau to reach the city's goal of providing constitutional policing. You might also consider addressing the staffing and leadership of the new riot squad, which is under development. Much like the Alaska Airlines plane that failed three recent pressurization tests and then lost a door plug shortly after takeoff last week, nearly causing a disastrous loss of life, the city has received warning signs of disasters waiting to happen in the police bureau, including these three officers who brutalized Ms. Clark. Another disaster waiting to happen is Officer Chuck Elam, a former rapid response team member whose actions caused your approval of a $13,750 settlement last year for violence against a member of the media. Sergeant Elam has since been promoted and is now listed as a team leader and lead instructor for the next iteration of the riot squad that PPB is forming. You might address how the city believes the community is safer when known abusive officers who not only have caused harm to community members, but who have disgraced the police bureau by being implicated in the dirty hippie slide fiasco can be promoted and entrusted to lead the next group of riot squad members. Last month, when council approved $10 million for body cameras and $3.4 million for taser upgrades, one of your reasons for doing so is to satisfy requirements of the DOJ settlement agreement. We hope you'll use the same reason of satisfying the DOJ settlement agreement by complying with paragraph 170E, which requires the city to report the number, nature, and settlement amount of civil suits against PPB officers. Instead of prioritizing parts of the agreement that lead to the police getting more equipment, Please focus your efforts on the parts that provide more transparency and actual safety for the people of Portland. Thank you. Next up, we have Angelica Clark. Can I be heard? Loud and clear. All right. Being assaulted in a community where you were born and raised, where you felt safe and protected, can really mess someone up mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally. 
On top of that, not having the support you need following traumatic experiences genuinely changes a person. Traumatic experiences in general, as many of us should know, change a person. Policies over people policing must end. We can see this now within general public um, as people disassociate themselves from the reality of the continued cycles of genocide and brutality that are actively taking place in areas such as Congo, Sudan, and in Gaza, Palestine, what's been happening in Africa and on these indigenous lands since this nation's establishment in order to just function and live in their current capacity alone. But back to why we're here presently. For the past three years plus, my body has been overloaded by cortisol and the inability to get out of survivor mode. Prior to this assault, I had experienced life, school, work, studies as a social work grad, grief, and endured traumatic experiences walking alongside close family and friends. During those times, I was able to show up for my friends and family while maintaining a balance for myself. This meant finding sound ways to cope with those situations in order to function accordingly. Following the assault on my body by Portland police, however, I noticed within myself the inability to function outside of survivor mode and could not use the same self-care practices and techniques I had once used before in the same manner. Every morning and every day, my body was constantly overwhelmed by the cortisol running through me. I began to overwork myself in order to avoid the pain, the hypervigilance, the constant desire to keep moving out of the fear of allowing the grief and loss experienced amongst my closest relationships as a result of this assault. I began to make decisions out of position of survival and necessity, praying that the anger, the pain, and loss of my entire sense of self that I had endured that day would subside, and I could once again gain function, once again function as I was once able to before. Unfortunately, that day has changed me forever. I began to recognize my own struggles in regard to my cognitive functioning and abilities and sought out resources for my assistance during my recovery. I am still recovering to this day. These past few years have been a battle of which I've had to constantly reassure my mind and body each and every day that I am safe and I am well. Going through this process of even filing against the individuals that caused this harm and damage has also created cycles of harm within my life, reliving the trauma and grief. Familial and cordial relations became skewed, and my ability and desire to interact with others greatly declined. This settlement offer still feels like a slap in the face, and though it goes against my original decision for trial, I've agreed to the settlement solely out of protection for my mental health and to hopefully begin to move forward from the police assault on my body experience July 2020. And Ted Wheeler, the way that you interact and engage with the public has been and is still disrespectful as hell. Respectfully. Next up, we have Lawrence Ray Clark. Lawrence, you're muted. Okay. Hi, good morning to the commissioner and the panel. I'm here in today regards to how it feels as a father where your daughter come home all beat up, all out of her mind, freaked up and afraid. And I've always been the father that protected my family. Nothing more important to me is God and my family. When I see my daughter treated like that, to know what she's going through today. Everything that happened to her came back on our family. All of my siblings, you know, all of my, her sisters and brothers, there's this, this big family disorientation now because of what the police department done to her. I've lived in Poland for a lot of years and I've had my experience growing up with the Oregon policemen. So I'm a Vietnam vet, so I know what the pain feels like. But the pain that I feel now, that's, what my daughter's going through, I feel her pain every day. And every day I, I, I wake up at sometimes three o'clock in the morning and deal with my own PTSD. And all this did is added more PTSD on me. Feeling helpless as a father. Not able to help my daughter. I don't even see my daughter anymore. You know, she moved out of this state, you know, because she just couldn't cope. You know, and, and that's I feel like a failure. And it really makes me angry. I've done everything in my power to save God. Good thing God has grounded me. 
you know, like I said, I had my past with the police officer. You know, I've been mistreated in Portland. I could have been in prison today because I was sitting in an alibi restaurant many years ago. I went to the city, complained about it. One officer walked in, looked at me, and then he come with another one. I'm sitting there with the cook for over oh, an hour and a half talking to he not making my food. And they tell me, get up, come with me. Take me down the street. And they literally shot a flashlight in my face. And they were with this water off the tall, big, redhead, and freckled. He was yelling every day, nigga this, nigga that to me. And I'm saying, what's going on? Come and find out. And the girls kept saying, no, 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 that's not him, not them. Come and find out. So what had went into the hotel room, killed the guy, but found the drug. And, and if they would have said it was me, I would be in police, I would be in prison. They was something I did because how they were trying to force those young ladies. I don't know who they are, but I owe my life to them. And so, the, you know, things have to change in this city. This used to be a great city, you know? It used to be a great city that I saw so much traumatized things happen in these last few years, which had more to say. Next up, we have Dina Clark. This, this experience has really traumatized our whole family. The pain that Erica has endured, I feel as a mother, I feel I've lost a daughter. No parent should ever feel like they've lost a child. I feel like my daughter is... Honestly, I feel as if the only thing that's missing is the burial for my daughter because I've lost the little girl that I've raised to make a difference in this world. I mean, she's always been community service. We've always been a part of that. That's something that we've always raised our children to do. But now with the police beating on her, I remember the day that she came home and standing in my living room, her face was just beat red. Her lips were swollen. Her whole body was there. We were trying to wash. It hurts me as a parent because every time I see the police officers or she sees the police officer, I'm sure she rekindles all of that. I feel like I've lost her. It's caused so much problems in our families because of what has happened that I don't even know when we could have family reunions again with my family reunited. What they did to Erica was like, they discriminated against her because of her skin color, her size, because of her gender. I feel that those police officers abused their power because why don't they, why didn't they choose a man? Why didn't they attack a man? They had to choose a woman to attack what if this was your wife? What if this was your daughter? You come home and you're proud that she's out there making a difference and she comes home beaten by the police. I hope you never have to experience, there's no amount of money you can put on the pain that a child is going through. That money will come and go with those memories, that mental illness, that pain is going to be with her forever. This is something that has to change in Portland. There has to be an example for the amount of money that they're asking. That is just, that's just to me, that is honestly a slap in the face. I never knew how much it was, but now that I know that isn't even enough to scratch the surface of what a mother feels of the loss of a child in a family because of this that has happened in the city of Portland. Why don't they do this to the Proud Boys? Why didn't they do it to a man? They had to choose a woman because of her size and her gender and her skin color. I hope this never happens to you guys, ever. Our last testifier is Leonie Reyna. They haven't joined us. That completes testimony. All right. Thank you. Thank you to everybody for your testimony. 
Colleagues, any comments or questions? This is an emergency ordinance. Please call the call. Rubio. Aye. Brian. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Miller. All right, the ordinance passes. Item number 25, also an emergency ordinance. A settlement of Roja Hutwagner bodily injury lawsuit for $100,000 involving the Portland Bureau of Transportation. Colleagues, this ordinance resolves a lawsuit brought against the city in October of 2021. Deputy City Attorney Carolyn Turco and Senior Claims Analyst Karen Bond are here to walk us through this ordinance. Welcome. Good afternoon. This case involves a traffic crash in which a pedestrian was hit by a vehicle um, while crossing the street. The crash occurred on October 24th, 2019 in Northeast Portland at the intersection of Northeast 26th Avenue and Northeast Sandy Boulevard. The pedestrian, Radia Hutt-Wagner, was walking southbound across Northeast Sandy Boulevard and the driver was headed westbound. The crash occurred at approximately 5.30 p.m. and the driver's view was blocked by the setting sun. Radia Hutt-Wagner filed their lawsuit in state court against the driver of the vehicle and the city. The lawsuit alleged that the driver was negligent for failing to look where he was going while driving. The allegations against the city centered on a failure to make the intersection safe for pedestrians. Given the risk of an adverse jury verdict, the parties negotiated and mutually and reached a mutually agreeable settlement. Under the settlement, the city will pay $100,000 to resolve this lawsuit. The city attorney's office and risk management recommend that the city council approve the settlement. I'm happy to answer any questions council has. Otherwise, this concludes my remarks. Thank you very much. Colleagues, any further questions on this item? Keelan, do we have public testimony? No one signed up. All right. This is an emergency ordinance. Please call the roll. Aye. 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 Gonzalez. Aye. Epps. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. Item number 26, a non-emergency ordinance. Authorize revenue bonds to provide not more than $53,430,000 to finance Veterans Memorial Coliseum projects. Colleagues, this ordinance authorizes the issuance of limited tax revenue bonds. This is the next step of a multi-year process to complete the Veterans Memorial Coliseum renovation project led by our spectator venues team. By authorizing this borrowing, the city will be able to benefit from funding opportunity provided by a partnership with Multnomah County and Metro under the visitors facilities intergovernmental agreement. The proposed bonds allow the city to maintain the city asset with an external funding source that would frankly otherwise be unavailable. These bonds will finance critically needed systems and facilities updates to VMC that will enhance the overall visitor experience. It'll improve the safety and the sustainability of the building. And uh, as we all hope and expect, it'll attract more events, attendees, and positive economic investments into our city. Matt Girock from the Bureau of Revenue and Finance and Carl Lyle from the Spectator Venues team are here to walk us through this item. Welcome, Matt and Carl. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. Uh, yeah, first off, thank you for the opportunity to present this item. For the record, I'm Matt Girock, Debt Manager in the Office of Management and Finance. Uh, as the Mayor mentioned, this is a borrowing authorization that will allow the city to issue bonds for a project that has been in the planning stages for quite some time. Uh, before diving into specifics about the borrowing, we thought it would be helpful to review some of the history of the project, as well as the anticipated renovations. I'm going to hand it off to Carl Weil to take us through the first portion of the slide deck. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Carl Weil, City um, Spectator uh, Venues Program Manager. 
Um, yeah, so uh, briefly, I'd just like to do a little history on kind of the project and how we how we got here. So um, we've been working on this and city council actions leading to the renovation of the Coliseum date back uh, about 12 years at this point, at least. Um, it was in 2012 that following an extended public process to consider alternative reuse scenarios for the Veterans Memorial Coliseum, um, Council directed the Office of Management and Finance to, to work seriously on reinvestment into the aging uh, multipurpose arena to preserve the activity that it represents for the community. In 2015, uh, we saw a series of alternative investment options uh, into the building uh, studied in more detail with the options study, which was presented to City Council. Um, the clear outcome of that uh, round of study was that really the, the most viable and most economically beneficial and feasible solution for the building was essentially to reinvest in it as what it is, a multi-purpose arena, and to grow business lines where possible, but also preserve the activity that, that uh, has, has taken place there for many, many years. In 2019, the city, Multnomah County, and Metro all approved amendments to the visitor facility intergovernmental agreement that the mayor referred to, which committed debt service payments, so the full amount of the debt service is covered by this source, for the VMC renovation bonds to be paid from these dedicated tourism funds in the visitor facility trust account. This account receives a portion of the transient lodging and vehicle rental fees, and its purpose is to fund investments into the infrastructure that supports events, travel, and tourism in Portland. In 2022, we extended the uh, Coliseum operating agreement with Rip City Management through the fall of 2025, and the parties committed in that process to work together on implementing renovations. And last June, we brought the necessary amendments to the design and construction project management contracts to City Council for approval and gave you a little overview of the of the project and the scope there as well. So today's action, or well, this this authorization, um, uh, this ordinance, which will be approved next week, presumably, um, to, is to authorize sales of the bonds. And it's the last council authorization step before construction activities are scheduled to begin at the building uh, this coming summer. Next slide, please. Um, so as confirmed in the 2015 Coliseum options studies, there's a strong case for renovating the Veterans Memorial Coliseum. Reasons include the over $30 million in annual economic impact of continued operations, which is expected to increase significantly after uh, renovations as the building becomes more appealing to more different events. The fact that the building is operating uh, at a financially sustainable uh, rate um, and actually had a record year in uh, fiscal year 22-23 in terms of revenue generated. Um, additional factors include the benefits and opportunities that come with having two arenas with a single operator, the possibility of dual events, um, and the historic status of the building, and the opportunity to grow new business lines with an improved facility. Next slide, please. So these bonds will fund a strategic set of improvements informed by the 2021 reinvestment strategy that was developed by the city, working with our team of design professionals and informed by a community advisory group representing diverse perspectives on the building and users of the building. Uh, next slide, please. That strategy confirmed that in addition to continuing ongoing sustaining investments into the building to keep it operational on an annual basis, uh, the initial focus of larger investments should be to address critically out of date mechanical systems, many of which are original to the building from 1960, and then to upgrade the seating bowl with all new seats and associated code uh, required improvements, such as restrooms, exiting, egress, safety features. F for future, currently unfunded projects can then be pursued later as resources allow in the future. To be clear, this the, the, the proceeds from this bond uh, authorization and issuance will not meet all the needs and all the things we'd like to see in the building, but it will make a huge step forward into, into um, to that future. Um, next slide, please. So here's a high level list of the type of enhancements these bonds will fund at the building. The takeaway here is that these investments will result in a Veterans Memorial Coliseum that is much safer, much more reliable, more accessible, more comfortable, and more appealing than the one we have today. Next slide, please. Uh, so I have just a couple of before and after. These are fun uh, images to show uh, kind of what we can expect with the renovations. So this first set is looking at the seating bowl. Uh, and so today, this is what it looks like with the original 1960s seats, and this is what we can expect to see after implementation of the renovations in the bowl. So all new seats, hand railing, um, reconfigured cross aisle. And the next set has a close-up of the cross aisle. So this is the current um, accessible seating areas, 
very far from meeting ADA standards and code requirements, as you can imagine, uh, from 1960. So this is how it looks today with the original seats and the existing cross aisle. And the next image is what the improvements that we can see. Next slide, please. Um, and so this is what we can expect to see there with fully compliant, uh, much more generous, accessible seating areas and uh, group seating boxes, as well as hand railings throughout and various other safety features. So it's going to be uh, really transformational uh, in terms of the guest experience. Uh, and that is the end of my slides. And I think Matt has a couple slides on the uh, technicalities of the bond and how, and how this works. Thanks, thanks, Carl. Uh, so I'm going to provide a little bit more information on the, uh, the FIGA. Uh, so the purpose of the VFIGA is to support regional uh, visitor facilities and the visitor industry uh, in the region. The VFIGA provides for two separate tax revenue streams that are deposited into a trust account held by Multnomah County, where then the funds are dispersed for allowable costs outlined in the IGA. Tax revenues for 2023 totaled $22.2 million. Uh, the first priority for revenues is debt payments, where bonds are paid in an order of priority based on the date they were issued. There will be three bond series paid from the trust account after these bonds are issued. And you can see there is a fourth um, future contemplated uh, bond issues as well. Um, there, are, there are not definitive plans on there. Uh, so after sufficient funds are available, uh, to make the full debt service payments for the fiscal year, the remaining budgeted funds are made available for program expenses, including operating assistance to travel Portland, the visitor facility operators, and the county. So next I'll talk uh, a bit more about the bonds that are being authorized by this ordinance. So as a review, the bonds are a loan that will need to be repaid to purchasers of the bonds. These bonds include a pledge of the city's full faith and credit, meaning all legally available funds, including the general fund. By including a pledge of the city's full faith and credit, we will be able to improve the investor interests and thereby attain a lower interest rate on the borrower. The bonds are considered self-supporting debt under our debt policy because the loan will be repaid from revenues other than the general fund and because of the relative strength and the long track record of the trust accounts revenues. As mentioned in the prior slide, the VFTA, the Visitors Facilities Trust account, had $22 million of tax revenues available for bond payments in 2023. This is equivalent to 140% of the trust account's total annual bond payments after these bonds are issued. This cushion means that revenues can drop roughly 30% before any of the VFTA reserves would be needed. Reserves were approximately $20 million at this point we're in. 2023. As an additional backstop, the financial resources of the city's spectator fund would be exhausted before the general fund would have to step in to make any bond payments. The amount to be authorized is 54.43 million of funds for the project, plus additional amounts to pay issuance costs on the bonds. Uh, this year, until the bonds have increased the city's total bonded debt by uh, just 1.8 percent. Based on current market conditions, Annual debt service is estimated to be $4.65 million per year for 20 years. The bonds will be issued as taxable bonds due to the, uh, the use of the facility, the nature of the use of the facility. And we anticipate that the bonds will be sold this coming March uh, via a public bond offering. Uh, I also wanted to mention that the VMC bonds that we're discussing uh, will be sold alongside a separate bond refinancing of PBOT's 2014A bonds that were originally issued for the city's Southern Bridge contribution. And that refinancing was separately authorized by city council under ordinance 190747 in March, 2022. Uh, as Carl mentioned, the Coliseum renovations are expected to commence later this year and be completed in 2026. And I'll wrap things up by reiterating that this financing allows the city to utilize outside resources to maintain one of its capital assets, and that this borrowing is self-supporting and poses uh, relatively low risk to the city's general fund. And uh, we'll open that up for any uh, comments or questions. Awesome. Colleagues, any questions? Commissioner Gonzalez. 
I just had a, a, a more conceptual one, fully supportive of what we're discussing here. But as we think about the future of this portion of um, the city and what's going on with the Blazers next door, um, how do we, What what is our flexibility? How do we preserve flexibility to pivot as our broader um, plans in the region might evolve? Um, I mean, again, I'm fully supportive of what we're proposing here. Um, they're, they're much needed uh, investments. I just, but I wanted to ask that big picture about flexibility, you know, as we, as we have a lot of things going on, uh, Albina district, uh, the Blazers, what's going to happen in Lloyd district. Um, these are big kind of generational investments and just wanted to at least make the space for us to think about how we're allocating these dollars and do we have space to to pivot down the road if if other assumptions materially change um well well th thank you commissioner i think i think that's a good question and and i would say just a couple of things Th these particular funds that you know as you saw the the long timeline of of actions and and efforts and work to get to this point um you know th these funds that are backed by the visitor facility trust account through the agreement are are not flexible right i think that's that's clear these can only be used for this project and they're the result of that that very long time sort of effort to to make these investments possible into the coliseum i think going forward and looking at you know additional investments or future revenues or uh, other things down the line, we absolutely need to be considering all those other factors. Uh, but this is really kind of the the, the very last step in, in an over 10 year process to kind of get to this point. And I would also say, you know, these investments are specific to the building and, and it are, are critical to allowing us to continue operating the Coliseum uh, as it is. Uh, without these investments, you know, the risk of closure goes up every year because you could have a, you know, a dramatic failure of some critical system or a safety issue or, or whatever. And then, and then we have a building that is, is historic and unusable and difficult to, to try to figure out what to, what to do with. So I think, um, I guess I'm bringing that up because I think that the larger questions of what is outside the doors of the Coliseum are not really impacted necessarily by, by this investment. This is about continuing to operate the building and certainly the district around it is anticipated to, to redevelop and, and change in the future. But to, to our knowledge, there hasn't been, um, you know, a, a serious call to, uh, to, you know, close down the building or, or, or not, not keep it operating. And if we're, we're working on the assumptions that we want to continue uh, the economic activity represented by the building and continue operations, these investments are necessary to continue to do that. Yeah, and I, I guess what I would just submit as much for the public, again, when we're thinking longer term about this portion of the city, um, this is a wonderful facility. It's got long tradition. It is it's historic in many respects. Um, but if we want to think big, you know, we have to continue to keep all things on the table. And um, I, uh, I guess I just leave it with that. But thank you. Thank you for the answers to the questions, Carl. Commissioner Ryan. Dan, are You're you muted? muted? There you go. Uh, thank you so much, Carl and Matt, for the presentation and for the additional context. Uh, 12 years in the making. Wow. I, I'm delighted that construction will begin in the summer of 2024 and finish in 26. Um, especially hearing about replacing the seats. I can't be the only person who's had a mishap why going to a uh, Winter Hawks uh, match and uh, experiencing a, a little rip um, in those old seats. So I'm um, delighted with that uh, upgrade. I assume the Portland Winter Hawks are your number one resident in that entertainment venue. Is that correct? So uh, they're a very important tenant where they have the most events in any any given year. Uh, yeah, that's what I meant. So they're the they're, they're your number one um, resident since they're they have the most events. How active were the Winterhawks in these um, renovations? Uh, we're actively talking with them. They're obviously very supportive. Um, they also have uh, a, a nice long evolving list of of other desires that are not necessarily. Um, within the project scope, but we're in regular communications with them uh, on on the improvements and on the scheduling of the construction, the impacts and 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 so forth. So they're they're quite involved. Okay. 
I'm happy to hear that. I, I, when I met with them, I could tell they would, they want to be very heavily involved in, in these plans. And I just wanted, I don't know if, I don't think you called this out, but today we have 54 um, toilets, if you will, for women, and it's going to increase to 90. Um, when, when will that actually be put forth? Is that at the beginning of the construction or towards the end? Uh, that's a that's a good question, and I don't think we can count on all 90 being in place until we're finished with the entire uh, phase of work. It's going to take um, uh, such a long time because we have to work between the events, and there's limited periods where we can close the building down to do some of this work. So it's not like we're going to be able to um, deliver all the restroom renovations, for example, in in one summer. It'll probably stretch out, and and it'll really be the end of by by 2026. I think we'll see everything in. in so you got to my last question, which was, um, how will this uh, interfere with uh, the staging of events in the, uh, and so it sounds like you're going to be working around events and doing it uh, in yeah. between. Yes, yeah. so, some work is able to happen during during the seasons, which is really the hockey season when the building is, is busiest, you know, from yep. fall through spring. Uh, there will be uh, closures for some the bulk of 2024 in the summer, so June through September, and and again in 2025, June through October. So that that helps me realize that you are prioritizing the winter hawks by focusing on the close down in the summer, correct? Absolutely. All right. All right. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Commissioner Maps. Um, I want to thank Commissioner Ryan for asking the bathroom question. That's been on my mind, too. Um, I'm, I, I suspect we've all or many of us have probably heard about um, how our limited capacity and in, in bathrooms in this particular facility also limits uh, potential uses of uh, this space, which is unfortunate. Uh, I'm glad at least this project should move us in the right or in a better direction there. Um, although I'm disappointed it couldn't happen faster, but I guess we can just do what we can do. Um, I have, maybe I want to also ask a broader question. Probably this one should go to Matt. Um, Matthew, uh, so we're issuing 54, or the proposal on the table is to issue $53 million in bonds for this facility. I support that, but I also, um, I don't have a clear sense of how much bonding capacity the city um, has and how much we are, how close we're getting to a practical cap. Uh, this bond is a common sense thing. There are some other proposals out there for other bonds too. Um, how much room do we have? And is there, how much bonding capacity do we have at the city? Um, and do we have a coordinated process for evaluating which bonds to prioritize? Uh, thank you very much, Commissioner Mash, for that question. Um, so we did go through a uh, rating criteria change uh, with Moody's, and um, so it's definitely uh, an evolving area. Um, but based on the prior um, criteria, we, we had plenty of room um, under our, our, um, our debt metrics. I don't have the details on my fingertips, but I, I would plan on visiting with um, each of the commissioners in their office uh, to go through uh, the credit rating in a bit more detail and kind of um, provide you know, what we were with, like, credit rating score card and, and uh, answer additional questions. So I don't have uh, specifics at my fingertips, but I look sure. forward to, to, to visiting um, to, to all the commissioners on this. Well, uh, thank you for that. And it, it's sort of an unfair question. Um, I will uh, state for the record um, that at least I feel like I need to have a better sense of uh, our current financial landscape around uh, um, bonds. I don't know if that if we can take care of that through a series of uh, uh, in-office conversations. It seems like it might also be a topic appropriate for a work session. Um, although, frankly, I, I think getting in a work session in this calendar year might be a little bit tough. Uh, but I think the stakes here are high enough that I, um, I, I hope that we can do some more analysis and more education um, on the city's bonding uh, capacity in particular. Uh, but thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, when this comes back to council, I will certainly be voted yes. Very good. Thank you, colleagues. Any further questions? Keelan, do we have public testimony on this non-emergency ordinance? No one signed up. All right, very good then. This is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Thank you for your great presentation.
Item 27, an emergency ordinance. Authorize a contract with Washington Park Transportation Management Association for Transportation and Visitor Management Services. Commissioner Ryan. Thank you, Mayor. Colleagues, if you don't already know, Explore Washington Park is a nonprofit formed to manage transportation services and programs in Washington Park. And they have done so for the last 10 years. The program's funded through the Washington Park Paid Parking Program, which also began 10 years ago. Explore Washington Park's experience makes the organization uniquely qualified to continue managing these services at Washington Park. I'd, I'd like to introduce Todd Lofgren, our Deputy Director of Parks and Rec, and Victor Sanders, Program Coordinator, Coordinator for a brief presentation. Welcome, Todd and Victor. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. I'm Todd Lofgren, uh, Portland Parks and Recreation Deputy Director. I'm here with Victor Sanders, our Program Coordinator. As Commissioner Ryan said, uh, Washington Park has many attractions as great service through Explore Washington Park for attractions like Portland, Chap Portland Japanese Garden, World Forestry Center, Hoyt Arboretum, Oregon Zoo. Uh, there's as many as 3 million visitors a year that visit the park. Uh, the, city con the city's contract before you today is with uh, the Washington Park Transportation Management Association. They do business as Explore Washington Park for services and programs associated with transportation management for Washington Park. Explore Washington Park, as Commissioner said, is a nonprofit organization formed at the city's request whose sole purpose is to implement transportation management for Washington Park. Explore Washington Park, through its board of directors, has successfully managed transportation, visitor, and parking services for the last 10 years. And every year we see about 75,000 free shuttle rides that are provided to visitors in Washington Park, as well as uh, free shuttle service to about 56,000 visitors for overflow parking services. Each year we also provide about 65,000 maps in English and Spanish and pre-trip information to make sure people know the best way to get to the park, whether that's on the max or using their personal vehicle, using TriMet buses, or taking advantage of the free shuttle. Funding for these services come from the Washington Park Trust Fund, which is derived solely from Washington Park parking revenues collected by the city as part of our pay to park program. Portland Parks and Recreation has successfully negotiated a new contract for the next five years to provide these valued services. And finally, this contract has unanimous support from Explore Washington Park's nonprofit board of directors, which includes representatives from Metro Oregon Zoo, World Forestry Center, Japanese Gardens Society of Oregon, Hoyt Arboretum Friends, Sylvan Highlands Neighborhood Association, Arlington Heights Neighborhood Association, TriMet Travel Portland. And so we're requesting council's approval for the item before you today. Thanks. We're here to answer any questions. All right, very good. Colleagues, any questions on this particular item? Not seeing any. Do we have public testimony, Keelan? No one signed up. Please call the roll. Rubio. Uh, aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. This service provides excellent value to the community because this covers Washington Park shuttles, uh, the service to Oregon Zoo, Portland Japanese Garden, Oregon, Portland Oregon Japanese Garden, Hoyt's Visitor Center, and the World Forestry Center. The zoo lights are a great example of why this is important. These services are vital in both the spring and summer. Thank you to Parks and Recs for continued support uh, they give to in keeping this run. I vote aye. Maps. Aye. Wheeler. Hi, right, the ordinance is adopted. Item number 28, a second reading. Amend building regulations code to adopt portions of the 2021 International Building Code, the State of Oregon 2023 edition of the Oregon Residential Specialty Code, and the 2022 edition of the Oregon Structural Specialty Code. Any further discussion on this item, colleagues? Please call the roll. <clears throat> Rubio. I want to thank Matt for his efforts in updating the building code and keeping the city in line with state building code and international building code. I vote aye. Ryan. 
Yeah, I'm really happy to vote to remove code clutter. Because of my experience with permitting, I really understand that these amendments help bring our code into compliance. And we were negligent for some time. So I appreciate the actions that were now taking place. And here these code changes can be checked for alignment with other internal bodies, such as PBOT. I hope to see more of these smart um, actions and due diligence. And then our code directly impacts the safety and well-being of Portlanders. And it's helpful to our builders as time is money. I vote aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Apps. Aye. Miller. I want to uh, acknowledge that I uh, have uh, not been here for the original part of this. I've been updated by my staff on it. I'm very supportive. I vote aye and the ordinance is adopted. Next item, 29, also a second reading. Amend city code to update certain boards of appeal terms, reduce the number of alternate members, and make other process changes. Colleagues, also a second reading. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Rubia. I want to th thank Matt Rosal for his presentation and his work on these technical changes that will allow for efficiency and continuity on these uh, appeal boards. I vote aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Epps. Aye. Mueller. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. Item 30, this is an emergency ordinance. Amend property tax exemption code and system development charges for affordable housing developments code to temporarily enable home ownership opportunities for households earning up to the 120% of median family income. Commissioner Rubio. Colleagues, this legislation offers temporary flexibility for the city's two main development incentives for home ownership. The Home Buyer Opportunity Limited Tax Exemption, often referred to as FOLTI program, and the System Development Charge, or SDC, exemption program. It temporarily increases the income level allowed for home buyers purchasing these homes in order to address market conditions, which are making it difficult for builders to find eligible buyers. This is a small but important way that we can tax provide temporary relief during a time when high interest rates are getting in the way of healthy function of this program. So we are bringing this item as an emergency ordinance because of the time sensitivity of home purchases. Our goal is to address this problem as quickly as possible so that folks who are trying to purchase a home but just barely don't qualify for these programs can move forward. However, after discussions with Commissioner Maps and his team over the last three days, I would also like to make a motion to remove the emergency clause so that we can give ourselves a few more days to dig into this proposal. When this comes back for a second reading next week, we could choose to add the emergency clause back in if it's uh, the will of this council. So now I will pass it off. Oh, I'm waiting for a second on that. Second. We get a second. Commissioner, Mapp, uh, Commissioner Rubio moves removal of the Emergency clause, Commissioner Maps seconds. Commissioner Maps. I uh, second. Very good. Commissioner Maps seconds. Okay, so thank you. So I'll now pass it off to the team at PHB to share more about this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio, Mayor Wheeler, Commissioners Michael Bonacore, Interim Director of the Housing yeah. Bureau. And Michael, I'm sorry, no, just, yes. just so don't forget. Can we go ahead and vote on the removal of the emergency? Ah, clause? Apologies. Just so I don't forget. Oh. All right. We go ahead and call the roll. Do we have any testimony on the amendment? Assuming no, Keelan. Um, Mayor, we do have people signed up for this item. I don't know that it's about the amendment. All right. Let's, let's go ahead and do this. Let's keep that amendment on the table uh, through the testimony. And Commissioner Rubio, if you could just keep me honest and remind me that that's on the table. I'd appreciate sure. it. Will Back do. to you, Michael. Thank you, Mayor Wheeler. <clears throat> uh, so I am co-presenting today with my colleague, Dory Hellier, who is our program manager for development incentives. And this is one of a number of items uh, in front of you for consideration that will lend itself to our shared goal of unlocking development potential in the city in the midst of a really difficult development and real estate market. Uh, so I'll give you just a quick overview to kick us off and then Dory will walk us through some more specifics. Uh, as the commissioner said, the system development charge exemption program and the home buyer opportunity limited tax exemption or HOLTI program are designed to reduce the cost of home building to the extent that it can make buying a first home affordable to people at the lower end of the income spectrum. Households earning up to 100% of area median income 
for home purchases up to about $455,000. Uh, for a long time now, home builders have uh, requested that we increase the um, income eligibility from 100% to 120% area median income. We've not adopted that recommendation heretofore as we've prioritized folks who are uh, who have a little bit lower incomes and the program has been successful in helping them get into home ownership. But as we all know, the real estate market has changed and in particular, increased mortgage rates have moved the goalposts for all of us and made first time home ownership that much more difficult. So we re-looked at this question and whether there was an opportunity to respond in the immediate term and make a temporary adjustment to the program. And just to kind of humanize what we're about to propose to you, in a real world example, we recently had a single mom wanting to buy a home with the Holti and SDC exemptions in place, ask us if there was any way to make an exception for her being just a few hundred dollars over income. She had a recent job change in which she increased her income, which would allow her to be more financially stable as a homeowner, but she may now have to wait to buy a home because she was counting on the exemption programs to help her qualify for a loan. So this not only prevents this and other families from the home buying opportunity, the overall downturn in successful program participation means builders are taking some homes for sale off the market and renting them out and new construction is stalling. And it becomes one more element that challenges our ability to address the housing needs analysis that you all recently adopted. So before we jump into the presentation, I want to dovetail with uh, Commissioner Rubio's comments and just acknowledge that the use of these incentive tools always comes with trade-offs and Commissioner Maps and his team have been very engaged with us to understand the potential impact of foregone revenue uh, from SDC exemptions on our partner bureaus where SDCs fund infrastructure services for water, transportation, parks, and environmental services. Dory will touch on that in the presentation, but just at a high level, know that uh, what we're proposing is temporary and very short term, and the revenue that's anticipated to be foregone is already budgeted by the bureaus. So this move isn't expected to forego more than what's been anticipated. We just get us closer to what's been forecasted due to current underutilization of the program. But that said, we understand the tension that exists between the desire to spur home building and home ownership with the need for infrastructure revenue, and we're committed to keep working with our colleagues to better understand those impacts. So thank you, and I will turn it over to Dory. Hello, my name is Dory, Van, uh, Dory Hillier. I am the Manager of Development Incentives with the Bureau. And to just give you a little more information about what this exact proposal means, as mentioned already, it's a temporary increase in the maximum income limit um, where the proposal helps home buyers achieve the valuable effects of home ownership now, as Michael mentioned, by maximizing the existing programs in place. The temporary increase of the maximum income level from 100% median income to 120% median income will help home builders find qualified buyers and avoid increasing holding costs. We've crafted this proposal to impact homes that have already been approved for exemptions or are actively in the application process, um, rather than making broader changes to the long-term programs without having a more in-depth conversation on the program's impact, both to home builders and home buyers, as well as to the taxing jurisdictions and infrastructure bureaus affected by the potential foregone revenue. The foregone revenue associated with these applications has mostly already been accounted for by the SDC bureaus and Multnomah, and Multnomah County because these terms will only apply to applications submitted by March 1st of this year. Home builders will need to sell these homes by July 1st, 2026, and any applications received after March 1st this year will fall under the current income limit of 100% median income unless further changes are made to the programs in the future. Slide, uh, next slide, please. The SDC and Holti programs are part of a suite of home ownership tools um, offered by the Housing Bureau, including down payment assistance and funding for home buyer education and foreclosure prevention. 
Um, the programs are used for both um, for-profit market rate developers and nonprofit organizations, the latter who generally have additional subsidies available to reach lower income households between 60 to 80 percent of median income. What are these programs exactly? <laughs> so the Holty program provides a 10-year property tax exemption on the assessed value of homes which are built under the program and sold to eligible home buyers within the annually established sale price cap. The average exemption amount for each home was about $3,000 per year. For the SDC exemption program, it reduces the building permit costs by up to about $30,000 through exemptions of the SDCs that would otherwise be paid to environmental services, parks, transportation, and water. For the last fiscal year, on average, the, um, the average SDC amount has been about $22,000 for each new home built. Together, the programs encourage the development of new homeownership opportunities within Portland, and both programs require homes to be owner-occupied and not used as rental properties. To income qualify, homebuyers um, currently must earn no more than 100% of married, median e e family income per household of four, and the sale price cap this year and, and last is $455,000, so well below the sell price, the average sell price for the, the city at large. Next slide, please. Current financial and other market conditions have increased the cost to build new homes, uh, despite council approved actions allowing denser infill development. These same conditions affect the interest rates and loan terms available to home builders and home buyers as well. With interest rates having been up to around 8% recently, Home buyers' purchasing power has been reduced significantly. As a, re as a result, home sales have declined by 50% since peaking in 2021, and homes are staying on the market longer for all housing types. And that's according to RMLS data. Sell prices that have increased year after year have declined 3 to 4% since 2022. Condominium units, which many of these under the um, program are. Um, permitted as, or ended up divided as condominiums, um, have seen sales decrease by about 25%. There are fewer homes available within prices affordable to the home buyers at 100% median family income. More homes approved for the Holt and SDC exemption programs are selling for over the sale price into unqualified home buyers. In these situations, the SDCs are repaid and um, tax exemptions are removed. Next slide, please. This slide shows the incremental stages of the market through median sale price levels, the sale price cap for the exemption programs, and the corresponding income at 100% median income since 2015. Prices have increased until this year, as has the exemption program price cap which we have tried to balance with the increasing costs of construction, which is what is affordable to low to moderate income home buyers. Even though median income levels have increased significantly in the last two years, affordability has decreased dramatically, primarily due to interest rates. Interest rates alone um, affect the affordability um, you know, just say even between five and a quarter to 8% interest by over $100,000. So uh, last slide, please. We'll get to questions, but in summary, I just wanted, wanted to note that the temporary increase of the maximum income level for the Holty and SEC exemption programs to 120% and median income expands the pool of income qualified home buyers able to access the programs now. Doing so will allow home builders to continue with our participation in the programs rather than selling to over income home buyers or risk converting homes to rental housing or ending up in foreclosure. The increase will not prevent home buyers earning less than the usual 100% median family income to still purchase homes in the program in the meantime, and limiting the time frame for the increased income limit allows for the city to reassess the programs in the near future when interest rates will have hopefully decreased to more traditional levels as seen in the recent past. Limiting the applications that this change affects to those in the midst of the current market conditions decreases the impact to the SDC bureaus and the taxing jurisdictions and doesn't increase the amount of foregone revenue from what has already been forecast. 
I'm happy to answer questions. All right, colleagues, any questions? Commissioner Maps? Um, yeah, I, just a, a couple of questions. Um, number one, thank you for the presentation. And um, I also want to thank my friend and colleague, Commissioner Rubio, for uh, moving to uh, pull off the emergency uh, piece of this that will allow um, our infrastructure teams to have more dialogue with um, uh, 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 the folks with Commissioner Rubio's office and the Housing Bureau to develop a clearer understanding of how um, this program is likely to impact water, environmental services, Peabody in particular, although I'll also point out uh, Parks has, um, has a horse in this race too. Um, and I also think that in the end we'll reach a consensus and be able to make this, uh, expedite this ordinance eventually uh, kicking in. Um, a couple of questions for staff. Um, you might have mentioned this in your presentation, but can you remind us how many homes are likely to be impacted by this particular proposal? Um, looking at for the SDC exemptions, um, we're estimating about 900 to 1,000 homes are unsold that have already had applications approved. And within that subset, another 240 or so Holti homes or so the same properties, but lesser um, Holti applications. And so I, I guess one of the things I'm trying to wrap my mind around is what does unsold mean in this concept or in this framework? I mean, I assume these homes would have, if we do nothing here, what happens? I mean, do these houses sit on the market or does it just mean that people who are not subsidized by this program um, would be buying them? That was a way for us to just narrow down the scope of which homes could be could access this change, but they could be in a multitude of situations in that they're just now getting their permit uh, issued under construction already or having built the home and haven't been able to um, sell just yet. So if, you know, at this point they have the option to sell to someone up to the 100% median income, sell the home at an increased price, potentially if, if the appraisal will sustain it to a non-qualifying home buyer or um, repay the fees and make other options with the, with the property, you know. Great. Um, thank you. Although I'll confess, I'm not sure if I fully track that, but I'll go back and watch the tape and um, and catch up to you. Um, I think the last question I have um, about this particular program is by lifting the cap, should I think of this as, are we serving a different population here or has inflation or whatnot sort of distorted things? In other words, if we had a program that was initially designed to help low-income folks uh, um, buy homes by raising the cap to 120%, are we still serving low-income folks, or are we, or is this, or is kind of the purpose of the program evolving? Well, I think as as um, Director Boynikor mentioned, you know, there are a lot of home buyers that are right on that cusp, right? And so, you know, with again, sort of the perfect storm of conditions. We have to draw the line somewhere. And so that line being drawn there is affecting essentially the same home buyers that have been accessing the program before. Okay. Um thank you. Uh, um there thank you very much. And um here be here I'm gonna pivot and just address my colleagues on council. Uh number one, I wanna congratulate the Housing Bureau and Commissioner Rubio for coming up with innovative ways to make uh, housing more affordable. Um, you know, one of the ways we did that is we we're able to kind of shave off about $30,000 of the cost of, of a new home uh, by essentially infrastructure bureaus and parks um, eating our SDC fees. Um, you know, we're glad to do this. I voted in favor of that a while ago. Um, on the other hand, especially in the water, sewer, road space, you know, those dollars are used to actually build and support infrastructure that exists in the real world. In other way, words that 
I suspect is probably about 25 grand uh, that the infrastructure bureaus um, absorb in order to subsidize affordable housing. That's not free money. We're just kind of displacing where the cost of that housing goes to. And right now we're putting the, those expenses on uh, um infrastructure bureaus and i'll just remind uh, my colleagues we still have to pay for our infrastructure and in, in the end we pay for our infrastructure either through um utility rates or through frankly uh um, gas taxes and we've all had some concern about um the appropriate place to peg both our utility rates and in coming weeks we'll have some discussions about how much uh um we um tax gases too um in other words there's just no free lunches in this space um there are trade-offs uh um i'm not saying this is an unreasonable trade-off but we should also be mindful of what's happening here uh um, because we're in practice kind of shifting um costs from one cost center to another uh with the goal of achieving uh an important public good, which is helping uh, um, everyday Portlanders get into homes. But um, we should be aware of some of the trade-offs that are in place here. And with that, I'll thank you and close my hand or, or lower my hand. Thank you. Commissioner Ryan. Yeah. First, Mayor, do we have any, do we have testimony? We, I think we do. Keelan, how many people do we have signed up? You have two people signed up. I, I prefer to listen to that before I, I might not even need to answer, ask my questions. Very good. <laughs> Colleagues, any other questions before we go to public testimony? Seeing none, Keelan, go ahead and call the first person. First up, we have Justin Wood. Hi, Justin. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Um, so good afternoon, and thank you for allowing me to testimony, uh, testify on this. Um, I'm a huge supporter of this. Um, as I've been doing infill starter entry homes in the city of Portland for 25 years, and this is something that has been a big program that we've been able to use and, and you've been able to be able to put families into homes. Um, as many of you know, I think uh, I've, I've served currently I'm serving on the governor's housing production advisory council. And in, in all fairness to the city of Portland, it's not often that I go out into public and say things that I think the city of Portland is doing well um, when it comes to building and development. But I actually have held this up as a model around the state, as I think is this a great program. And the, with the governor having goals of trying to increase home ownership at that 120% of MFI level, I think this is a great program. And this kind of aligns that I know this is temporary, but I think this kind of aligns with the state housing goals of trying to increase home ownership in that 120% or below kind of working uh, space. Commissioner Maps, you would ask. I think that number of 100% to 120%, it largely has moved up in part due to inflation, but in part just kind of the changing market is what buyers are actually able to buy. Every single home that we build in the city, we utilize the whole, we try to use the whole team program and the STC waiver program. And we're finding that the same families, your, your teachers, your police officers, whatever, they can't apply, they can't qualify for it at that 100% anymore. So that number has just shifted. So this aligns better with the market reality of trying to provide those same buyers to be able to get them into those homes. Um, one of the things I want to make sure people realize is because some people kind of look at this and think this is just a, a help out for developers. When I use the SDC waiver program, that doesn't does not put an extra dollar in my pocket. I almost every single one of us take when we use that program. We if you look at our listings, you can see that we've actually reduced the sales price of the home by that equal amount. So it's just a way for us to open up those home sales to those buyers that otherwise wouldn't be able to. And the downside to not having a big enough pool of buyers being able to buy these houses is what ultimately is going to end up happening is builders like myself have to sell those homes to a qualified buyer. And if it can't be somebody utilizing the program, then we have to sell it to a, a buyer that, do, that doesn't qualify and it removes those homes from the program. And in a case like myself, I really don't want to do that. I'm a believer in this program. There's not a lot of us who utilize this program, um, but I, I think that that's a really important niche that we need to fill. And so for this short term for the short term period, um, I really think having the city provide us some help on this to try to make this work through this period of time where we've got the high interest rates um, to try to just open up that program to people. And, and as, a, as, a, as the Housing Bureau said earlier, these are all houses that have already had STC waiver programs approved for them. So this isn't necessarily money that the infrastructure bureaus is not has not already expected to lose. So um, uh, so I think that this, in the grand scheme of things, I don't think this is a, a huge budget hit to uh, what people are expecting. So I, I'm, I've been using this program for years, talk about them at the state, happy to answer any questions, but thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Justin. Next up, we have Preston Korst. 
Hi, Preston. Hi there. Hey there. Thanks for having me uh, this afternoon. Um, my name is Preston Course. I'm the Director of Government Affairs at the Home Building Association of Greater Portland. We have about 1,200 members operating across the region. Um, and of course, Portland is a priority jurisdiction for us. Um, I want to basically just thank and reflect everything that Justin just said is, is absolutely right. Um, I think one thing that I'd like to, to call out, and of course, we support you know, as an association, we support this um, resolution and hope that um, next week we come back with uh, a yay vote for this um, unanimously, unanimously, hopefully. Um, there are two things that I sort of want to call out. The first of which is the fact that um, nationally and even in Portland, there are, uh, I'd say about the majority of uh, home building is about 90, 85% market rate built. So when we talk about housing, things that incentivize the market to do uh, to do good essentially is really the most important thing in terms of getting units produced and reducing the overall housing crisis uh, so with that in mind i think um i want to sort of call out the fact that as you know builders you know again the majority of us uh, the those people who are building the 90 percent of our homes do compete against one another um, and anything that they can do to sell their homes faster especially in an environment with interest rates as high as they are. Uh, of course, time is money. Every month and day that a house sits on the market costs them. Uh, that, so, so looking at tools that can help builders, you know, incentivize builders on the market side, you know, market rate side, do good and build at you know, sub $455,000 a unit uh, is great. So I want to encourage everyone to think about sort of the impact that this will have, not just on supporting and helping home buyers, which of course this is, this is important, but this is one of the few tools that exist to cities to incentivize home building that could have the impact of overall, um, you know, to have the impact that we need uh, to really uh, grow our housing production rate, but also lower the overall um, housing crisis on those that, that need housing the most. So I will stop there, but just, just know that the Home Building Association and our many members uh, who use this and who don't use this program uh, do support it and hope that you will find a way to keep it permanent and also expand it as much as possible because the more successful the program is the, the more units that are actually being um, waived and you know accessing this program the more successful it is so thank you for having me thanks preston commissioner ryan yeah thank, thank you mayor thanks for having the testimony go it was really helpful um you know we have homes sitting and we need to sell them for working class Portlanders. I think all I'm looking for in it is some more clarity on the thresholds that would uh, that would trigger this type of action in, in the long term. I think we're having a, a short term response that's really obvious, but it, I hope we can learn from this on maybe, um, I think we could look into what these thresholds are like when interest rates are doing this and we have um, homes sitting on the market in this program so long. I, I've been here before a couple of years ago with a different side of this. And I just think that we can learn from this moment so that we have some uh, crisp thresholds on one, what would dictate this going forward. Thanks. Very good. Uh, all right, good. That completes testimony, Keelan. Yes. All right, good. Uh, colleagues, any further business on this? Wait, I want to thank, sorry, we, go we ahead. We could do the vote on the amendment. Oh yeah, thank you. That was exactly your job and you did it well. Uh, colleagues, Commissioner Rubio put an amendment forward to remove the emergency clause. Any further discussion on that? Please call the roll on the amendment. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Camps. Um, I want to thank uh, Commissioner Rubio's office and the Housing Bureau for their dialogue around around this. This is a really real collaborative effort, which involves multiple bureaus, some mine, some not mine, uh, to make housing more affordable uh, for Portlanders. There are lots of moving pieces here, and uh, at least on the infrastructure side, we appreciate the opportunity to learn more about how this uh, program uh, is likely to impact the infrastructure space. Um, I vote aye, but I fully anticipate that we'll be able to come back next week with a 5-0 vote in support of this, and uh, should Commissioner Rubio want to make it an emergency Emergency ordinance at that time. Um, I suspect I would be highly uh, um, inclined to support that, and uh, would even be happy to second. Uh, for these reasons and more, I vote aye. Taylor. 
Well, I want to thank Commissioner Rubio for her leadership on this issue, as well as the Portland Housing Bureau staff for their creative work and problem solving to develop what I think is a very sensible reform. And I appreciate the, the, the two gentlemen who testified in support of this effort. Given current market conditions and, of course, our housing emergency, this is one important step amongst many others that we need to take to increase access to affordable housing and the economic opportunities associated with home ownership in our community. So I'm happy to vote aye on the amendment. The emergency clause is removed. And this is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Next item, please, is item number 31, a second reading. Declare a surplus city-owned property at 3737 North Emerson Street, an adjacent recreational lot, and authorize a public sale of the property. Colleagues, this is a second reading. Again, I wasn't here for the first reading. I've been updated on this and am fully versed and prepared to take a vote. Is there any further discussion on this item? Seeing none, please call the roll. Rubio. Aye. Wayne. Oh, there goes aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Epps. Um, I just want to thank everyone who worked on this. This has been another collaborative effort that has involved people from many different bureaus. Really glad to move this project forward. Uh, for these reasons and more, I vote aye. Miller. I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. Last item for this morning, item number 32, an emergency ordinance. Authorize emergency construction contracts with OR Incorporated for an estimated amount of $1,885,610 for drinking water well repairs and upgrades. Commissioner Maps. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Colleagues, this item comes to us from the Portland Water Bureau. This ordinance authorizes the Water Bureau to enter into emergency construction contracts with OR Incorporated for an estimated amount of about $1.8 million. Now, these funds will be used to pay for the replacement of failed pumps and motors in two of our groundwater wells. In addition, these funds will be used to purchase a spare pump and motor for use in one of our two largest groundwater wells. Uh, here's a little bit of background on this item, which explains how we got here today. Um, as all of you know, most of the time Portlanders consume water drawn from the Bull Run watershed. However, on occasion, the Water Bureau also relies on a network of groundwater wells to supplement the water the city draws from Bull Run. Currently, the city has four wells that require emergency repairs, uh, which brings us to the ordinance before us today. Here to tell us more about this ordinance, we have Portland Water Bureau Chief Engineer Jody Inman. Uh, Jody, please take it away. Uh, thank you very much, Commissioner Maps. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'm Jody Inman, Chief Engineer for Portland Water Bureau. And as Commissioner Maps introduced, we are here today for authorization for emergency construction contracts with OR Inc. for an estimated amount of $1,885,610 for drinking water well repairs. Uh, this past fall, we had a fire in the Bull Run, Bull Run watershed, which reinforced the strength and robust character of the city's water supply, which includes two excellent sources of water in the Bull Run watershed and the Columbia South Shore well field, as Commissioner Maps described. The fire also emphasized how critical, critical it is to maintain the capacity and readiness of that secondary supply. This ordinance reflects contracts that were enacted as part of the Camp Creek Fire Emergency Response for that exact purpose of ensuring that the groundwater supply was ready and available both during the fire and if needed going forward due to impacts to the bull run supply from the burned area, such as increased turbidity. Our groundwater supply consists of 26 wells and multiple aquifers that can provide up to 90 MGD. The work included in these contracts includes replacement of failed pump and motors in well 6 and 16, which represent approximately 10% of the groundwater capacity, and the purchase and installation of a spare pump and motor for use in 13 or 19, which are our largest and most critical wells and represent approximately 22% of the groundwater system capacity. 
Combined, this ordinance reflects construction contracts that improve reliability for approximately 32% of the groundwater capacity. And that includes my presentation. I'm available for any questions you may have. All right, colleagues, any questions on this emergency ordinance? Seeing none, uh, and don't take it personal, Jody, we, we've had four <laughs> hours of session. Um, I, I'm just, before you at the end often, so. <laughs> yeah, it just, it just means you've been very succinct and helpful. Uh, Keelan, do we have any public testimony on item 32? No one has signed up. Why don't we go ahead and call the roll, please? Review. Uh, thank you, Jody, for your presentation. I really appreciate it. And um, thanks for hanging in there today. Uh, I'm supportive of all these, uh, making authorizing these contracts to move forward. I vote aye. Ryan. Yes, we see you, Jody. Uh, I vote aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Apps. Um, I just want to thank my uh, team over at Water for being so proactive on this particular issue. Uh, for those of you who have been watching the space at home, the fires that we had up at Bill Run uh, this summer really do underscore how important our backup supply um, uh, of water over at uh, our wells is. Uh, I want to thank my colleagues on council for uh, supporting this common sense move to do some basic maintenance to make sure that we can get that water out when we need it out, which is why I vote aye. Taylor. I also vote aye. The ordinance is adopted and that completes our business for this morning. Colleagues, we are adjourned until 2 p.m.